I lived in a small suburbish area of a small town. My house was very close to my grandparents' house. It went my house on one block. A large church with a large parking lot was the entirety of the next block, and then the block of my grandparents' house. My grandparents were both retired, so every day during summer while their parents were at work, a few of my cousins and I would spend the day at my grandparents. Honestly, it was such a fun childhood to have. When I was around 11, my parents bought us a dog. One of my chores during the summer was to walk over to my house and let the dog out to use the bathroom and then go back to my grandparents. One of my cousins who was a year older than me would always go with me. Well, one day when we were on our way back to my grandparents, a guy drove next to us. It was one quick motion. He opened his car door and yelled, Gotcha! My cousin and I took off running. He quickly shut his door and sped ahead of us into the parking lot of the church. Instead of running through the parking lot, my cousin and I ran behind the church, but continued in the direction of my grandparents. When we emerged from the backside of the church, the guy was still in the parking lot, his head on a swivel, looking for us. We continued to run. A few heartbeats later, he spotted us. We heard his tires squeal again after us. Thankfully, we were very close to my grandparents and quickly made it inside. We ran in and told my grandmother, who of course didn't believe us, and told us to go back outside to play. So my cousin and I went back outside. Still spooked, neither of us felt like playing and just sat on the front porch. Soon the guy drove back and slowed down as he passed. We ran back in to tell my grandmother, who again didn't believe us, and told us to go back outside. Well, the third time of us coming in and interrupting her soap opera, she finally came out to the front porch, and at the same time, the guy passed again. She called the police, and when we were talking to the police officer, the guy drove by again, and we pointed him out. But the police officer just took our statement and left. We never saw the guy again. I would like to think that the police officer pulled him over and scared him into not bothering us again, but I highly doubt it. We were at a sportsman warehouse in Colorado with our parents. I was 14 and my brother was 12. We were on a trip to see family. So we were about done walking around and decided to sit down on a camping chair while we waited for our parents to get done shopping. While we were sitting in there, a lady that looked cracked up on some sort of drug walked up to us and started asking us weird questions. She asked us, Where is the Colorado River? Can you show me on this map in the front where the Colorado River is? There's this map of the U.S. in front of the store, right by the entrance. She kept telling us to walk up there with her because she needed help finding the Colorado River on it. We were both weirded out and started to walk to find our parents. She kept following us and didn't stop. We found our parents and told them what happened. My mom started to yell at the lady, but she wasn't going away even after that. We checked out and started leaving the store. When we walked out, we saw the creepy lady and three or four men run out the store towards a van that was hidden out of camera view. Two of the men were waiting outside the store and that's when I realized what was happening. The lady wanted my little brother and I to go to the front of the store so that the two men could abduct us and run to the van. I'm so glad we followed our instincts and didn't follow the lady. To this day, I'm still very cautious when I go into town, especially because I live near the border of Mexico. Don't talk to strangers, even if you are an adult. You never know how many people are in on the abduction. I started a new job this month, and my workplace is only two blocks away from the bus stop, with one of those blocks being a public sport place with a public pool and running tracks, etc. I always go through there instead of around because it's shorter and busier so I feel safe. However, the next block is quite lonely with not a lot of traffic from cars or people. 
This morning, I was about to cross the street and an SUV stopped. I didn't find it weird because I thought the driver was being kind and letting me cross before continuing on their way. After that, I kept walking really slowly because I always make sure to arrive exactly on time and I was like 5 minutes early today. As I was about to turn right, I finally realized that the same SUV was a little bit in front of me, almost at my side, turning right really slowly. My workplace is surrounded by houses and in a decent neighborhood, so when I saw him driving slowly I just assumed that he was going to go park in front of his house. However, he didn't stop, and I thought, oh well, maybe he has to open the gate on the porch. I don't know. But instead of getting on the car, he just stayed in there. That freaked me out, but I kept walking. Like I said, really slowly. When I was about to be at the side of the car, I didn't know what to do. Should I run? Walk normally until I pass him? Or what? So I started walking more quickly, and when I was on the side of the car, he waved or did a sign at me. I don't know. I didn't catch it clearly. I ignored him and finally passed him, but once I did, he started the engine again, and he is right by my side. I finally arrived at my workplace, and he stopped again. I quickly rang the bell. I can actually open the door from the outside, but I didn't want him to see how. Also, by ringing the bell, I was basically telling other people to come outside for me. Immediately after I rang the bell, he accelerated and left. I feel really bad for not memorizing his license plate number or even remembering his face. I really hope that no other girl has to go through this. Even if I had all his information, I'm from a third world country so police won't do anything about a potential creep. Now I'm scared. What if he comes back? What should I do? He knows where I work. Okay, I'm just looking for opinions on this encounter because although it was years ago, I always think about it and wonder, what the fuck? So basically, we were crossing the border from Costa Rica to Nicaragua. The border has a long standing line where you have to wait to go through the border control and there's a bunch of taxis on the other side. The line is long. My friend and I, both female and 23 at the time, we were at the back of the line. This man comes up to us speaking Spanish. We don't understand, but he guides us towards the front. We don't understand, but he guides us to the front of the line and puts us next to two other American girls. We are confused and ask what is going on, but he says in broken English, you four together, I take you in taxi. We think it's weird, but we did skip some of the line so we stay next to the girls. We talk to them and we all agree that we think it's very strange that he put four young backpacking girls together when we clearly didn't know each other and is aggressively making sure that we get in his taxi once we cross the border. Anyways, we cross the border and he's waiting for us. He begins leading us to his taxi. We tell him no and immediately jump into another taxi with two male backpackers who seem safe. As we look back, we see another guy yelling at the guy who was trying to get us to come with him. They are fighting. He seems to maybe even hit him in the head for possibly not getting us in his car. Was this normal or was he about to traffic all four of us? Bad vibes here. This next story is my mother-in-law's story. I was about 9 years old when I attended catechism school. It was like any other day, until it wasn't. I remember like it was yesterday. It was getting close to Christmas as I attended my weekly class and when I finished, I always walked home. As I was on my way home, there was this old, rusted beige four-door car parked on the side of the road with a man leaning over into the car. He was wearing dirty jeans and had a long sleeve shirt on with what appeared to be work boots. I kept my head down and continued to pass by him until he said, Hey, excuse me. I stopped and turned around. Yes? Can you please help me? My car won't start. 
I stood there and just stared at him. He then continued talking, asking me to help push something in, as he couldn't reach it. I walked closer to the door and looked inside. I leaned over to push a button from inside. Little did I know at the time, it was just a cigarette lighter. As I started to get up, he put his hands on my butt, trying to push me into the car. He said, No, you have to get all the way in to press it. I screamed on the top of my lungs. All right, all right, he said as he stepped away. I quickly got out of the car and started walking away. The man gets in his car and starts driving in my direction. He pulled up right next to me and said, Are you sure you don't want to come home with me? I screamed and he sped off. After he was out of sight, I ran home and didn't stop running until I reached the front door. I was out of breath, scared out of my mind. I ran to my room and slammed the door, crying my eyes out. My sister came into my room. She's five years older than me. She asked me what's wrong. I told her everything that happened. She told me that we needed to tell my mom. As she started to walk out the door, I grabbed her arm. No, don't. Don't tell mom. I didn't want my mom to find out, as I thought I would get in trouble. My sister ended up telling my mom, and she called the cops. A few hours later, the doorbell rang. I was scared and hid in my room. There were two policemen standing at my door. They came in and sat down and asked what happened. Scared as I was, I told them everything. They asked my mom if she would be willing to take me down to the station to look through a book so I could possibly point them out. Looking through the book of men, I spotted him, the guy that tried to kidnap me. Him, I shouted, pointing at his picture. That is the man. The officer said, thank you. You did good. We went home and about a week later, the police officer came back to the house and asked me to point out the guy who tried to kidnap me from another book. I pointed out the same guy in two different books at different times. They thanked us for our time and left. That night, I went to sleep and woke up screaming, screaming from a nightmare. My mom came running in and I was crying. What's wrong? What happened? The man, he took me. He threw me in his car and took me home. He hung me on his tree. He put me on the top of his tree like an ornament, hanging me on the tip of the tree. My mom told me it was a dream. I was so scared I slept with my parents that night. The next day, my mom called the police office and asked them what was going to happen. The policeman said since he didn't physically harm me or kidnap me, they couldn't do anything. At the time, I didn't think much of it. I was young. But attempted kidnapping and they did nothing? Years later, when I was much older, I found out that years after he tried to kidnap me, he got someone else and ended up killing her. That could have been me. One night, around 3 a.m., I was sitting at home on the PC, watching movies, playing games, etc., when I noticed I'm out of cigarettes. The only thing that's open late at night is our local gas station not too far from my house, but it's still easier to go by car. I took my keys and locked the house and went to the gas station. I live in a small European country, which is the most safe country on the planet. Still, that doesn't mean that bad things don't happen here and there. When I exit from the suburban area I live in, you need to take a right to take the main road. After that, you can just go straight for half a kilometer and then go another half kilometer to get to the gas station. On the way, I noticed some girl on the sidewalk. I usually drive slower at night because a lot of times people would speed and go through red lights at this time. She was walking faster than usual. It looked like she was panicked and it was two guys behind her who were about 10 feet away, maybe less, pointing at her and doing some hand gestures towards her. They gave me a real creepy vibe. As I got closer, I noticed the girl had a scary look on her face, like she was about to cry, but she didn't. So I pulled over close to her and very quietly said, Are you in trouble? 
she looked at me and gave me a head nod. I told her to get into the car and she did. I told her I was going to the gas station to buy some cigarettes and that I would take her home after I finished. She thanked me like a hundred times. I asked her if she wanted to report it to the police, but she said she only wanted me to take her home. I went to the gas station, bought some cigarettes and a bottle of water for her. She was clearly in fear. I took her home right after that. We passed the same street where those two guys followed her, but those guys were nowhere to be seen. Imagine if I didn't run out of cigarettes that night. When I was a kid, no older than 10, I was walking to the mailbox to get the mail for my parents. I was fully clad in my baseball uniform, ready to go. A car pulled over and an elderly woman urged me to get in the car. Immediately, I knew something was up. Come on, we're going to be late, she insisted. She went on saying that my bat and glove were in the trunk, telling me that my dad had given it to them. She said my dad couldn't take me anymore, so he asked them to take me since they lived nearby. I honestly don't remember what I did. I just remember the anxiety from piecing together what was happening. I want to say that I booked it and ran into the house, but as I've gotten older, I don't even remember anymore. All I remember is being back at the house and the creepy lady ended up ringing the doorbell. When my dad answered it, he was obviously confused and she told him that they were testing me to see if I would jump in the car. The most unsettling thing to me is, I don't remember if I actually got in their car. I'm not particularly old, but the experience pumped so much adrenaline into me that I truly don't remember it well. I try to remember. I can picture both outcomes of me running home and me going into the car. I don't remember getting scolded, so I tend to assume that the former occurred, but I'm still not sure. Testing a child or not, what a fucked up thing to do in your free time. It makes me wonder if this couple actually had the intentions they spoke of. I remember getting home and not saying a word to my parents. The shock was still fresh and I had no time to process what just happened. Was ringing the doorbell afterwards some sort of cover up for a failed attempt to avoid being reported to the cops? Has anyone ever encountered something similar? I just find this whole situation extremely off-putting. You don't really find too many kids walking alone with their baseball uniforms and coming up with that on the fly gives off the impression that this wasn't this lady's first time trying to coax a kid into her car. So I have many creepy stories to share, but I'll start with this one. This happened when I was 13. And it definitely looked like a 13 year old. I was a late bloomer. I was walking to a friend's house about a 20 minute walk on a summer's evening, so it was still daylight. The middle aged man in the car slowed down and asked me where I was going and if I wanted to get in and he'd take me. I giggled like a teenage girl does and said no politely and continued walking. He drove off and did a U turn back to me this time demanding that I get in his car. Teenage me gives the attitude and makes a face and continued walking. He starts revving his engine, speeding back and forth enough times to remember his license plate. By the time I got to my friend's house, I had let the encounter slip my mind. Fast forward a few days. I brought it up in general chit chat with my mom. and She was horrified. She called the police. I was mortified because she was embarrassing me and I could take care of myself. Anyway, the police came and took my statement. Remembering the license plate came in handy. They went straight to his house where his wife said that he was with her the whole evening. The police came back to me saying he matched the description I gave them and that he's been given a slap on the wrist. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall once the police left. As an adult now, I'd love to know what he wanted with a 13 year old child. I'm a female, 25, and I work on a cruise ship visiting countries around the world. Sounds cool, but it's hard work and may put you in some weird situations. 
This day, I was transferred from one ship to another. Usually, when you disembark from a ship, you leave with many other people disembarking and get into a bus hired by the company to take you to the airport. Well, this time was different. I was leaving the ship in the middle of the cruise, and I was the only one. It was my first time in that country, North Europe, and I get out of the ship next to the crew admin and find two different cars with two different drivers to take me to the airport. The admin is the one that made contact with them, and she is lost, no idea which is the correct one. One of them started to grab my luggage and putting it in the trunk, and the other approaches to stop him. They start arguing badly in their language, which none of us could understand. She then asked for the credentials of both to decide whom she would send me with. Needless to say, my mind at that point was going as far as the idea of human trafficking or other possibilities, and I did tell her that. Her face seemed concerned and confused as well the whole time. One of them gave her an ID with a picture and a company logo. The other one, only a business card from the company. She then said she was going to check them, and I thought, good, we'll see what's going on here. But she straight away sent me with the first one, the one that has the ID card, as she says she knows the names of the company. Well, of course, I didn't go chill. In the car, I was sending messages to my mom and boyfriend, sharing my location and explaining what was going on. Also, I opened Google Maps to see if we were going in the right direction. The driver then starts a voice call, also arguing with someone, and I try to download as fast as I can the translator so I can record and get the meaning. When I finally got it, he finishes the call and does not start another. He does not talk to me at any moment and keeps an unfriendly expression. I proceeded to check Google Maps, and to my despair, he does not take me the route I was hoping for. He then stops in a place that looked like a bus station, leaves the car, and starts taking my luggage out. I ask, what is this place? And he says, it's the airport, and we need to go to the immigration. I follow him to the entry, and it's a huge building, so I do believe it maybe it's an airport, just a different entrance, but I'm not yet chill. He takes me to this corridor. We finally check my documents with the officer, and he leaves me there. Okay then, I finally breathed. To this day, I didn't find out if the other driver was official or not. Once you leave the ship, you hardly have contact again with the people working there. It could have been something very innocent, but maybe my gut didn't trust that at all. I don't know if you consider the story really eerie, but I know I was scared, and I wanted to share it with someone. Hey everyone, before I begin, this has been reported to the local police with as much detail as possible. I have been searching for several hours on who to reach out to or how to put into words something I went through this evening. I came across this thread seeing someone post a similar thing last year. Tonight, my girlfriend, 22 female, and I, 23 female, were heading home from a picnic at our local park. As we drove away from the park and approached the stop sign, I noticed that there was a car parked at the stop sign. I remember thinking to myself that that seemed really odd. We pulled up to the car and stopped, and when I looked over I saw a man, his wrists tied together, a terrifying expression on his face as if he was screaming and crying for help. I froze and asked my girlfriend if she had seen what I had. As we pulled just forward from the car, she asked what I saw, turned around, and he was still there, wrists together on the steering wheel, staring and making eye contact with her. We both panicked, asking, Do we call 911? Do we circle back around? Trying to make sense of what we just saw, and I think it both hit us at the same time when we realized that it was most likely a tactic to lure us closer to his car. I know I've personally read multiple stories of possible trafficking tactics happening in my country. I am lucky to have seen these and knew to get away as soon as I could. Sure enough, when we drove off, he followed us for about a half a mile until we got to a busier road and lost him. I have been in a state of fear and confusion and panic ever since. 
It may seem like an overreaction, but I have, one, never been in a fearful situation such as this, two, never seen someone tied up in possible danger before recognizing the signs, of course. I guess I'm looking for reassurance, wondering if anyone out there has been in a similar situation. I'm really shaken up by this and truly baffled that we live in a world where this happens. Stay safe, everyone. I've been clean from all drugs since 2019. It took me a while to write this. I never thought I would be posting this because of how stupid I was and the stupid mistakes I made. I know I'll get all the duh comments, so don't even say it, I already know. I'm telling this story to remind people that everyone's intentions are not what they say they are. I am mentally traumatized from this experience and I get reminders of it every day. I'm grateful to be alive and have no idea what would have happened if I didn't get away when I did. So save the rude and cruel comments. Thanks. This story is based in September 2017, I believe. Such a fucking blur. I did whatever I could to survive in this harsh world. So please no judgment. I was on the streets, no family, and a soon-to-be meth addiction. Backstory, I started using crack in 2015 and figured out that if I sold my body, I could make easy money. I know, not ideal, but I was deep in addiction and at that point, I didn't care about anything. January 2017, I met Ty, who also smoked crack but worked every day, so I no longer had to do that. I was going on like 8 months free from selling my body and my soul. Also, when I met Ty, he had a place in the big city and he did a lot of work for people in the city. I was left on the streets by the man I had thought loved me at the time. I must have said something wrong because he flipped out and left with everything I own in his truck. Fuck, we had just spent two days getting high and I was sure he was just throwing a fit. So I went over to my friend's, let's call him E's house. It was my home away from home and I felt safe there. E was an older, maybe 60 year old man who liked to get high and over time became one of my best friends. I was able to take a shower and put on clean clothes. When I was done, I remember sitting on the couch with disbelief that Ty would just leave me like that. I started crying and wishing things had been different while E held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start to depend on myself and live a happy life. Across the street from E's house was a hometown bar where rappers and musicians would perform. And on that particular night, the bar had been filled with people from the bigger city about a half an hour away. Let me explain. Where I come from, there isn't a place for addicts to get clean. They do have women's shelters, which I have been to before. About 30 minutes away in the bigger city, where they have all the help you can ask for, if you're willing to do the work. At this point, I was ready to get away from everyone and everything. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere or close to where I was using. Remember, you have to remove the old playmates, playthings, and playgrounds. So that's what I needed to do. I went right over to the bar and found a semi-good looking guy headed back to the city I needed to go to. I told him I planned to go to a shelter in the morning and he told me I could just go with him and he would take me in the morning. On the ride, I remember feeling like a hundred bricks lifted off my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and an Obama phone with no minutes. The guy I was with had a pretty sweet ride. I said, you don't fuck with this, right? And I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head, so I rolled down my window and just let it go. I knew I was going to be in the shelter and had to get better. Not just for me, but I had kids and a family that at that time still hoped that I would get better. I wanted to start over. I just didn't know how hard it was going to be. Me and this random dude go to his friend's house and smoke a blunt. And I don't remember anything after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room. I mean, clean. There was nothing in it. It smelled like paint. As I looked around, I realized this was the place dude was talking about moving into. I got up and he took me to get coffee and then right over to the shelter. I was fucking terrified of what I was walking into. 
I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was I needed to better my life, and I needed to do it now. As we drove into downtown, I got a little nervous because I knew that downtown was full of crime and drug dealers, big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people and traffic. I then realized I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back. We pulled onto the street and before I knew it, he was dropping me off. There I was standing in the big beautiful clean lobby, just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Ty for almost 7 months and this was the first time he left me like this, so I was kind of hurt over that. I knew he had been seeing someone else in our recent month breakup and he wasn't afraid to show it. This place smelled like lime with spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk and was asked if I was homeless. Yes, I said. She didn't even ask me any more questions. She just looked at me with the sad eyes and said, Okay, hon, let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes and she hands me one. She explained it was for my personal things. I look at her with unsettling eyes and replied, I don't have any belongings, and I lost everything the night before. The nice lady gave me some toiletries and a pair of leggings. Next was intake, where I had to answer a bunch of questions, and was handed a paper with all the rules on it and on the top of it, and on the top of the piece of paper, it stated that there was no Wi-Fi in or around the building. You had to go down to the stop sign to get internet. My phone was off, but I could still use the Wi-Fi, but at that time, I really wasn't worried about it. I knew Ty was already probably staying with the other girl. Michelle was her name, so I didn't feel it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut off everyone and try to be different. When she was done giving me the rundown on how things worked, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird and I remember feeling sick going through those double doors with the stairs off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats. I was told to grab one. I followed her through the double doors into the day room, which was huge. It was filled with at least 50 females. A lot of older ladies with nowhere to go, but it was loud and bright. The walls to my left were full of lockers, which I was told to get one if I stayed there long enough. And in front of the wall, about 10 to 15 tables set up where most of the girls were sitting playing cards, coloring, and talking. The other side of the room was a shower bathroom and a small TV sat in the cart on wheels. Next to the cart was a table that had electrical strips full of chargers and phones. In the far back corner was a door that led outside to go smoke. It was nice. There were picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fence in the yard for the kids to play in. When 7 p.m. hit, the whole dynamic of the room changed. Everyone was moving around People were running in and out. Then you hear over the speaker, Roll call. Then you were instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on. They passed out blankets and pillows to those who were without them, and they let us keep the TV on. The first night was scary and lonely. Here I was in a strange place, not even two full days clean, off a week-long crack binge. I was up half the night, and my head was just racing. I finally fell asleep when the other girls started to get quiet. The morning came way too fast and the rule was, you had to get up by 7am. You didn't have to leave, but you had to get up. A lot of the older ladies didn't leave the shelter. They knew they had a place to stay and had nothing else to do all day. So they hung out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast, which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast food person, but that morning I was starving. I had a whole damn eggs, bacon, and milk. After breakfast, I went outside for a smoke and I noticed a teeny black girl with cornrows in her hair had some cards in her back pocket. I had been playing cards since I was a kid. My dad had taught me a few games. I played with friends and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was lonely. I didn't know where anything was and it was obvious I needed help. I asked the girl her name and if she wanted to come play cards and after two games we had a connection. She was cool and she liked me so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around new people and females tend to not like me 
so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. She asked me after playing a few more games of Rummy if I wanted to go into McDonald's with her. I was cool with that because I needed to learn the area anyway. On the walk there, as I was talking, something caught my eye. So I looked up and there was fucking Ty with all of my belongings in his truck right by us. I tried to call but he ignored me every time. Guess he was done with me for good this time. That crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink till I disappeared, but instead I got about 10 different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he was looking for some reason to leave me. Since a month before we broke up and I stayed at my dad's for a while. That's when he started seeing Michelle. I was just absolutely devastated. We continued our walk to McDonald's and I was silent and broken. That night was easier to sleep because I was exhausted from not having any sleep and just feeling done. I slept like a baby to be honest. The next day, Mish wanted to show me the place that she goes to for free lunch. The only thing was, it was a church and we had to sit through a 30 minute sermon, which I guess was cool with me. We were standing outside waiting for the church to open their doors and this blackened out Mercedes Benz with a trailer hauling a badass Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say, Damn, that's a nice fucking setup. I looked at Mish, and she looked back at the Harley. That's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. Will is what they called him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and to be part of a new community. Everyone was really nice going into that church. A guy at the door gave us a pamphlet of meal times and services offered. I followed Mish to one of the back pews and slid in behind her. The church was pretty, different colors and there was a choir singing in a low, almost quiet tone as people were taking their seats. I kind of froze when I saw that guy I saw come in. Will sat next to me. I looked at Meech and then quickly noticed the guy's gold watch. It could have been fake, but it almost looked like a Rolex. He was an older black gentleman, talked real smooth when he introduced himself with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand. No one in my life does that. I shook his hand and they were creamy, like he took very good care of them and obviously does not work a physically demanding job. He was nice dressed and had his pimp hat on like a fedora. It even had a feather in it. His cologne was strong but smelled good, like a man. He was handsome and smooth. He was also very confident. Sitting through the sermon, I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher. I remember looking at his clean, shiny black leather shoes and his socks that were black and thick. When the service was finally over, people started heading out into the dining area. I just followed Mish and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat on one of the ends of a long table full of chairs. Not even five minutes, not paying attention to our surroundings, just eating. Will came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at Mish and said, Do you mind? I know I didn't see any red flags. Of course, I see them now. But looking back, I was so clueless. He hardly said a word the whole time we were eating, and when he was done, he got up and threw stuff away, and I assumed he left. Misha and I decided to go home and play some cards and go to the clothing bank she knew of. We were walking home and talking when he pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window and asked if we needed a ride home, but he was looking at me with a steep stare. I looked back at Misha, and she refused. Smart girl. And I went with him. I'm a dumb girl. I think I was more curious than anything. I did not know how he made that kind of money and I remember wanting that. We drove around till curfew and just talked. I don't know what it was. I think we had a lot in common and we related a lot. He asked me how I ended up at the shelter and just asked me questions and I told him. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure if I trusted him. But I told him about my past anyway, how I sold my body for drugs, how horrible it was, and I even said I'm glad I didn't do it anymore. 
he didn't really say much about it and we agreed that we would continue our talk the next day. He said he would help me put in a couple applications and he had some errands to do too. I woke up the next morning to a text from Will that said, What if you made that kind of money, but spend it on yourself, not drugs? Everything you make will go to building your life. Just think about it. I thought about it. I'm not going to say why I agreed and went on with the idea that this would work and I could actually get my life together and my kids back. $200 a half an hour. I could be free. I chose to go with him. At that time, I think I thought I wanted to be with him, but really, I just wanted a way out of the situation I was in. I hated that stinky, loud shelter. I wanted out. He got me a room at the motel, and we dropped off my stuff, and he told me that I needed some new clothes. He did tell me that he had just got fired from a trucking company. He was a truck driver. He was currently trying to find another job, as far as I knew. He took me shopping and got me a few new outfits more or less outfits to take pictures in to bring in money. I knew what I was getting into, but I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. Will did tell me that if I went with him, I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back at how manipulative he was, made me believe that I would do this to make a better life. I started doing this a few times before I got addicted, a few times to make rent, or bills, so I knew I could mentally do it, but I was still unsure about where this was going to go. We got back to the hotel and I do my thing. I take pictures to post them. It didn't take long before I started getting calls. I did make some money and I kept every penny, and Will took me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought. They were black and gold, baby fats. Oh, I loved those shoes. I got like six or seven cute outfits, some makeup and hair dye. Remember, I came to the shelter with nothing, so being able to get all this stuff made me feel so good. I was confident in myself and was hopeful that I could get a place to start my new life within a few weeks if days like that repeated itself. Remembering how things went, I am starting to think I was a part of his game, making girls think they could do it and keeping the money, and just trapping them, and making them need you. It's sick. He tricked me. He made me think I could finally live a clean life. Yeah, I was escorting, but I treated it like a job. I bought another phone, so I had a new number, and used the Obama phone for work. I thought wrong. I later that day went back over to the shelter, and grabbed one of the shirts I had, and some personal things I left with Will. That night was cool. He was super chill. We talked in separate beds. We got two beds and he didn't act like he was interested in me, which I was happy about because I didn't want to be with anyone. I needed a break from emotional attachment. After Ty left me, I felt like I wouldn't trust anyone like that in a long time. So I was happy that I was in a comfy bed watching TV, freshly showered with money in my pocket. I had the best night's sleep I woke up to breakfast and time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got us breakfast and coffee. He ate with me and then left, said that he would be back in a couple hours, take my time and do what I gotta do. So I did just that. While he was gone, I dyed my hair and the works. Not long after I was done, the door opens and the female walks in. She's pale and has a beautiful face, long pretty blonde hair that ran down to her shoulders. She was real petite, way too skinny, and size B chest. She had pretty big blue eyes and had dark circles under them. It looked like she had been crying, and she was carrying a black trash bag that contained all her possessions. Will walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna, and she needed help too. He instructed me to get her together. Get her pretty and take some pictures and post them. He then told her to go and take a shower and asked to talk to me outside. We went outside the door and as I was shutting it, his voice got real stern and said, I see you have not made any money yet and why the hell is that? I tried to explain that Sundays were the slowest days. I would be lucky to make any money today, 
Before I could finish, he cut me off and said, I don't give a fuck. You need to make some fucking money. What, you think this hotel pays for itself? I pay for it. I will pay for it tonight, but for now on, you pay half and half of all expenses. Now go make some fucking money. I couldn't believe he was talking to me like this. I had never seen him mad, and his voice scared the hell out of me. I was looking at him when he cut me off, and I could see him get angry. His eyes got wide, and the white just disappeared, and they became all black. I was scared, but I did what he said. He left me alone for a while, while I went out and got food, and whatever he did. When Anna got out of the shower, her skin was more exposed, as she walked out of the bathroom in a small towel. I knew she was addicted, and I assumed heroin. She confirmed that after I asked her if it was going to be a problem not to do drugs because that was a rule for me. Why wouldn't it be a rule for the other girls? After my kid's father passed away from an overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls I knew I could get close to, so I cut that all out. And when she told me, I was like, okay, no girl, I'm sorry, you're going to have to make some calls because you can't stay here. At this point, I didn't care what Will had to fucking say. I didn't want her here, period. As soon as he came to the door, I stopped him and took him outside. I told him I don't think I could work with her. I didn't want to be around a heroin addict or any kind of addict for that matter. He did make her pack up her stuff and took her home. I think he was trying to please me for some reason. Will and I then rode to Main Street where all the girls walk and work. It was so weird. I don't know why I didn't just run then. I'll never know. About an hour or two of driving around, talking to a bunch of different girls, this random ass girl jumps in the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years, I guess, and she had been looking for him and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me, but still really pretty, like beautiful. She had long, thick, curly, jet black hair. I didn't really get a good look at her until we were back at the hotel. Will told me he wanted to get a few girls together to make some big money. I was going to be number one and that I would never post with another female because I'm number one. He told me that I was important and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick but she was gorgeous. Big blue eyes, pretty skin, small waist with a big round butt and she was a straight up bitch. She took benzos. She was prescribed to them. I guess that's why he allowed it. It wasn't long before I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular and then like at night she'd be falling out of nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started to fight with Will about it once. I didn't think it was fair honestly. Like bitch can get high but I can't. What Will would do was during the day he would leave me at the hotel to make money and he took Amy to the street to work her. Well, it wasn't two days before they came home with yet another girl. A young one. 18. Her choice, no family. I only know what they tell me. Her name was Amanda. She was short like me and a little chunky, which was okay. Guys like chunky too. She had blonde, long hair and a cute face. She was sweet and didn't say much. I tried to get to know her a little better, but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy and she didn't get much feedback. Most people that were calling were calling for Amy. Amanda stayed with us for a few days, but she decided that she wanted to go home. Will, Amy and I didn't stay at the hotel for long. We ended up deep into the city, the furthest away from a hometown. Bigger room and a nicer hotel with a view of the whole city. It had a shitty microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room. Will and Amy brought back two girls that night. I don't remember them much because I wasn't involved with them much. I posted them and the next day we made money. Every time a girl would make money, they would give it to Will because he had them believing that he was saving it for them and getting them everything they wanted. I continued to make money on my own and also gave him my money. I got conspicuous and I will never forget the moment I knew I was not safe. 
I was outside smoking a cigarette. I wasn't there long, but when I came back into the room, Lou had all three girls posing on the bed, and he was coaching them how to pose and take snaps of them. I didn't say a word and closed the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I felt, but it didn't feel right. I don't know if he heard me open and close the door, but I heard him yell my name and said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures. When I got on the website and tried to post the pictures, it now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. Will, unhappy, ran to wherever and put money on a card. When I tried to put the card in, it wouldn't accept it because it said it wanted bitcoins. I informed Will and even had to show him the page that it wasn't going to post and he got furious and yelled at me. He turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and to stay calm. It would be okay. He came right back in with a gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said I need to find somewhere else to post the ad or I'm done and then he left. I don't know if he realized that he did it in front of the three girls and I don't know what or I'm done meant either. I was so fucking terrified that that's when I knew I had to find my way to escape. I learned real quick that I wasn't able to just leave anytime I wanted to. After Amy got involved, Will changed. He started talking about taking us girls to New York and making big money and travel and go from here and there. And that alone scared the hell out of me. I wanted to build my life to get my kids back, not leave the state to trick, or maybe be killed or abandoned. No fucking way. I got fearful for my life when the gun hit me. I've been punched like a man, but I have never been hit with a gun. That night, I had a couple dates set up, and Will knew he had to take the girls and leave. I decided to make my plan to get away. The first date, I made 200. I put 50 in my purse and put 50 in the pocket of my bra, hidden away, and left the rest on the table. The second day, I made 150, put half hidden away, and the rest on the table. Will came in the door not long after I was finished and grabbed the money off the table. My purse was sitting right there, and I didn't see him do it, but he took the money out of my purse and said that he had to do something and left again. That's when I made my escape. I made 100 calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me. He had a friend come pick me up and bring me to his house. I will never forget the feeling I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of my stuff that I had collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would be coming up and see me. That feeling didn't leave until we hit the highway. I wanted to tell the story because I never been able to get through telling it. I couldn't help to think where I would be if I stayed and if I would still be alive. So Will, let's not meet again. So this happened a while back. I was probably around 10 or 11 years old, meaning my brother Alex was around 8 or 9 years old. We were walking home from the bus, which takes about 7 minutes to do, when I noticed something was off. I didn't see anything at first, but I just knew something was wrong. My brother and I start walking home, as the only two kids who got off at our stop were him and I. This blue silver beat up truck drives past us, and I think nothing of it. It never slowed down or stopped, it just kept going. Alex and I were holding hands, as my grandma always told me to do, as he's my baby brother, and I want nothing to happen to him. Nothing happens at first, but then the same truck drives around again, driving our way this time. There was a cul-de-sac at the end of our road. It was driving slower this time, and went up the road and turned, out of sight. Now, Alex and I were nearing a three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac to the other side road. Right off the main road, the man just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving, real slow, down the street towards us again. I knew we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I would not be safe. I don't know how I knew, but I did. 
As soon as we passed the house that blocked us from the view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him, exactly four words. No questions, just run. And we did. In our driveway, which was about a hundred feet long by the way, there's a few rose bushes and pine trees that divide our home and the next door neighbors. I'm dragging him there and told him to be quiet and that I'll explain later. I watched as the same truck drove down and around the cul-de-sac again before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth shut because he was crying and I was scared that whoever was following us would hear him and hurt us. I was more worried for him than myself at this point. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister. I had to protect him. I looked at him and said that the truck was following us and told him not to be scared, that I wouldn't let anyone hurt him, and he seemed to calm down a little. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the door to the truck opened and out came the man. He was tall, skinny, and messy. Short hair covered the torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts, and a puke green tank top. He entered a yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes and I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without getting this dude's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his truck. He started it and drove away slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure that he was gone before turning to my brother and saying, We need to run. When I counted three, we were going to run behind the house to the back door. Okay? He agreed and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I still didn't have a good feeling about this, but I knew we had to move. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across our driveway into our front yard to go around the house. As soon as we left our spot, I heard it. The sound of accelerating. He saw us. He was waiting for us to leave. He chased us up our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house and made him run ahead to the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house keys. The garage door was open, which was about 20 feet away from me. I swear to God I saw this man round the opposite corner of the house that we did. We entered and I slammed the door shut, locking it and deadbolting it. I didn't stop running until I opened the house door and ran downstairs with Alex, screaming our safe word. My grandmother made a safe word for us that was a normal everyday word that we could use if we were in danger. Just had to scream it basically. It woke up my aunt who worked the night shift and was sleeping. We told her everything and she stayed up with us until my grandmother got home. We called the police and that was my first interaction with an officer. The man was never caught. To this day I don't know what he wanted but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm just glad that my grandmother drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother and I would be right now if she hadn't. So to the messy man in the blue and silver truck, let's not meet again. I've been holding on to this story for years now and would like to finally get it off my chest. So my siblings and I lived close to the elementary school where we would often walk our dog in the playing field and the crop of woods or we would let our dog roam around while we played at the playground or made pretend in the woods. I think I was around 14 when this happened, about 10 years ago. This schoolyard had a playing field, a playground near the building, and a playground farther away from the building in the crop of trees. We were swinging on the swing set in the more distant playground, but from this area you could clearly see the residential streets and parking lot of the school which kind of wrapped around the crop of forest. As we are swinging, I see a SUV drive up one of the roads and pull into the parking lot. It's weekend, so there's no cars around and not very many people. Maybe the odd passerby also walking the dog through the school grounds. The SUV is about 130 feet away from where I am and I wear glasses, so I can't see very well what the people look like as they exit the car, but I can see some distinct clothing pieces. There are three people. Two looked older and are dressed as if they're older middle-aged, like in their 50s. I remember one of these people wearing a wide-brimmed woman's sun hat. The third person looked like an older teen or young adult in his 20s 
and was wearing a green and white striped jersey and cleats. It's not uncommon to see people walk or drive to the school to use the field and play sports. Though, looking back now, I realize it was odd that they parked on the lot, not on the side of the road, near to the field, which is on the opposite side of the property. In any case, I think, okay, just some grandparents and their grandson going to practice on the field and go about playing with my sibling. I remember watching the Theo walk away around the school building, completely opposite to where we were on the property. We have our dog with us, and after time, we decide to stop swinging and take the dog on a walk through the trails in the forest brush. Maybe 15 to 20 minutes had passed since we saw the car pull up. The brush we are walking in is basically in a very corner of the school property. There's a metal chain link fence in front of us, and beyond it is sidewalks and residential roads. To our right is another fence that separates people's backyards from the school ground. These homes all have tall trees growing along the fence for added privacy, so it's almost impossible to see into the school. My sibling and I were just on that age where playing pretend didn't really feel genuine and spur of the moment, like we were about to grow out of it. I'm feeling bored but don't want to go home yet, so I pick a branch of these red berries that grow on the schoolyard and say to my sibling, Hey, want to play a game? Which is code for, let's play pretend. I bend down and offer a berry to my dog as a starting point to the game. They've never hurt her. I'm speaking to my sibling who's walking in front of me as I bend down, but my voice trails off as I see my dog's behavior. She's completely ignoring the berries and me, and is instead moving past me slowly, ears back and nose pointed, as if she was approaching something. I follow her movements, still looking down. When I finally look up, there are the three people from the SUV, not six feet away from me. They are certainly not a couple of grandparents and a kid, but three grown men. I remember the faces of the two older men pretending to be grandparents. The foremost man had short white hair and white scruff facial hair. His mouth was open in a faint O, as if he breathed quietly and focused on keeping his footsteps light. The other man was extremely thin his cheekbones popping out, and shoulder length, greasy brown hair hung around his skeletal features. They had crept up behind my sibling and I silently, and remained just as quiet as they all turned their backs, quickly, pretending to point off to the trees like they were watching birds or something. It was bizarre how silent this whole encounter was. I immediately realized that we need to get the fuck out of there, and turn my attention back to my sibling as I grab my dog's collar and get her hooked up to the leash. My sibling is about a foot from me, but seems oblivious still to the three creeps in the woods right behind us. I tell him over and over again that we need to leave, but they had become wrapped up in the imaginary game I proposed moments ago. Finally, my sibling sees the men. I never look back at the creeps, only to my sibling. My sibling also stops talking and starts walking with me. Thankfully, an opening in the fence between these now haunted woods and the road is only a few feet ahead, and we get some distance and obstacles between us and the creeps. To my frustration, my sibling wants to stop on the sidewalk and pick some berries through the fence. I frantically tell him to come on, let's go. I still never look back towards the men, my vision tunneling on the safety of the open roads and sidewalks and homes in front of us. We get home without incident at least to my knowledge. Had the men followed us on foot, gone back to the car and followed, or simply gave up? I didn't care. I just wanted to get home, which was only a couple blocks away. When we got home, I broke down. I told my mom what happened, and I remember her reaction being kind of nonchalant. I had always been an anxious child, and she developed a habit of downplaying things in kind of a exposure therapy way. I realized I still didn't feel safe with this reaction and retreated to the basement to cry alone. In recounting the story to my mom years later, she said she did call the police but nothing came of it. I'm also very thankful for my dog as it likely saved the lives of myself and my sibling that day. In the years since, I became highly skilled in reading people's body language. I could tell when someone's lying. I can read people's emotions and intentions like a book. I can tell if someone's vibe is off from a good distance away.
This has become a blessing and a curse. So three fucking creeps from the woods. I hope no one else was subjected to your presence. And I hope you rot in hell for what you did. Let's not meet again. I think I was about 10 years old when me and my buddies decided to go out and have a good time. Back in those days, kids all around would make these poor man airsoft weapons out of plastic tubes and rubber gloves and use dry peas as ammo. So anyways, we went out and had a blast shooting at each other. And at some point, me and my teammate realized that a few of our buddies had been gone for quite a long time, but we had a general idea of where they went. So we started to head towards them. As soon as we arrive in the general area where we thought they would be, our buddies run fast as fuck yelling, Run you guys! There's this crazy old guy coming with a van! So I was a little confused at this time and watched as my buddies ran off, nowhere to be seen at this point. I see that van coming up and I panic and start running like hell. This guy catches up pretty quickly almost running me over with his van and yelling that if I move an inch, he would end me. He gets a hold of me and starts dragging me back to his van as I scream for help. When I'm almost inside the guy's van, this guy, maybe in his 20s with a heavy metal outfit, yells to this bastard, Leave those kids alone or I'll kill you where you stand. This guy turns around and at the same time this 20 year old drops him with a single punch and keeps beating him while telling me to run to my parents. My dad tried to find the guy who literally saved my life and thank him and reward him, but only found a puddle of blood where this happened. I'm a 26 year old female and was sitting down with my fiance talking about creepy things that happened to us as kids and I remembered this. I was about 8 or 9 and my neighborhood would do this Christmas house celebration where everyone's house would do something different. I grew up in a very quiet, secure, Everyone knows everybody, part of Florida. It was all my neighborhood kids and myself playing outside while our parents drank and did festive holiday stuff. As we were playing, this car pulled up and asked if one of us could show him the pool. For reference, my house was in the back of the neighborhood and to get to it, you had to pass a clearly visible pool. This was an older couple, around 50 I would say, so my brain didn't register the threat. I was a very kind and naive kid, so I offered to go with them to show them the pool. Right before I could get in the car, I finally remembered to tell my parents, so me and other kids run inside to get my mother. Upon hearing what was going on, her and the rest of the adults ran outside, and the car and the couple were gone. It's crazy to think about now, that I was most likely almost kidnapped on Christmas. Who knows what would have happened to me. So couple in the car, if you're still alive, let's not meet again. A few weeks ago, I was walking my dog later at night before bed. He's an English black lab, so he's pretty big and can look intimidating. He's very friendly though. I was only one block away from my house when this black car pulls up next to me. It starts to match my walking pace and stay next to me. My dog was on the right side of me and he blended in with the darkness so you couldn't see him from the street as well as he was being hidden by the parked cars. I started to panic a little as the car just slowed and stayed next to me. When I got to the end of the block my dog walks in front of me and stares towards the car letting me know he wants to cross the street. At that point the car just speeds off I immediately went home and haven't walked him at night since. Thought I'd share an old story. Still not totally sure how to discern this one though. For context, I was like 17. Female. When this happened, it was in a residential neighborhood where it's not all that common to find homeless people. So one day, I was in some bushes. At my usual smoke spot, near a public space but hidden, and a man walks up and finds me on accident. He looks half unkept, half clean, ripped but washed jeans, long hair, 
but combed and clean shaven. Big backpack, but has a wallet and phone. Still, I assume he's a homeless guy. I try to be polite, but also careful. Because I am a young girl at this time, and that's the nature of life. But he's also in a position where I can't get out of my spot without walking directly past him. And he's kind of blocking my exit with his body. Anyhow, he starts making conversation, just generally talking about if I like the town we live in, stuff like that. At one point, he starts going into all these crazy stories about how he's a love child of like James Dean and some golden age actress or something that I literally can't remember. And he's talking about all this time spent with Cher, and I'm just sitting there nodding politely, pretending to believe it, hoping he'll just go away. Then he starts getting into how he's a founder of the ARC, a chain thrift store. Again, I know this is bullshit, because I knew the history of the ARC from personal family ties to it. He's shown me all this proof. It's like old ARC, business cards, and stuff that anyone could grab from the counter. Then he starts trying to tell me he owns most of the apartment buildings in town and he'll rent me an apartment building for cheap. Again, the proof he's showing me is random notes and his wallet that he's allegedly scribbled on at this point. He's been spawning lies for the better part of an hour and I know He's just not going to walk away if I let him keep going. But still, I assume he's just a lonely homeless guy making up lies for fun. So I make up my own lie and say I have to get to work and slide past him hoping they'll be that. But then he starts following me back to my car and insists I take his business card. It's some random guy's card with his name and phone number written on the back. God knows if they were real info. I take it, then keep walking. He keeps following, and this is when he starts. Asking more personal questions, and red flags start raising. He begins asking if I live alone, if I still live with my family, if I live just with my mom, or my dad too. Am I close with my family? Am I happy at home? Do I have any brothers? How many brothers? Older or younger? Specifically brothers. Never ask if I have sisters. A lot of this stuff just makes me think. He's gauging not only what level of protection I have, but also who would be looking for me if I was gone and whether or not if I was looking to run away or looking for someone to put my trust into. Just very trafficy, kidnappy stuff. To end this all, I told him I live with my dad and my three brothers, all of whom who love me very much and were very protective and love to work out. He says okay, but if I ever need to escape home for a little or need a place to live, I had his business card, and I should call him, and he'd house me for free. I kept walking, he kept following, and I was not about to go back to my car. Let them know what I drove, and my license plate. So I just sort of stopped in the middle of the sidewalk, and at a crossroad, and stepped aside, and pretended to fiddle with my phone, and he walked in the other direction, and I booked it to my car, and left. I was wigged out. But also, you know, it still could have been an innocent interaction, and I do stand by that. But the way it ended up just freaked me out. So I filed a harassment police report, which they did not want to take, but I forced them to, just in case something happened to me or someone else. A week or two later, I'm at a shop in a different neighborhood, though one close by. Now I'm in the checkout line. And I glance behind me, and there's the guy. I look down. He's not holding anything to buy. So I try, and stay calm. Hand my stuff to the cashier, and ask her to hold it for me. And then I quickly walk out to my car, making sure he hasn't followed me again. And go home. I don't think he followed me to the store anyway. At most, he saw me walking in from the parking lot, and came in after me. But I think more likely, he was already in there. And just spotted me and walked up behind me or it's none of the above that's the thing is i really cannot tell if this was just me overreacting to a slightly odd 
possibly homeless man, or if it could have been something more sinister, had my responses and behaviors been different. So when I was a kid, maybe six or seven, this was the mid-1990s, we took a family trip to the beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house. A short walking distance from the beach, we went to the beach, and I was supposed to stay inside with my mom, but I wandered way down, and before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the houses looked the same, and I wasn't sure which one was ours. Plus, I couldn't see my mom anywhere. It started to rain, came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house, only it didn't lead to any house at all, but instead to a parking lot. There was a big dirty van parked there. It was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair, a hot pink tank top, and those big chunky thick glasses that were popular in the 80s, waving and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She said something like, oh my, it's raining. Where's your mommy? Let's take you to her. It's dangerous to be out here in the rain. You could get struck by lightning. She was very friendly, almost overly so. And the driver's seat was a very overweight man without a shirt on, a hairy gray chest, and some chunky looking gold chain. He was wearing yellow, tinted Elvis shades, and staring at me intently. He was also smoking a cigarette, which I knew was bad. The woman stepped out of the van, and kneeled down to me. She asked how old I was. When I told her, she gleefully remarked, Oh my, we have two boys your age at our house. You should come over and spend the night. We've got movies, Nintendo, and in the morning, we've got all types of cereal. I had been taught all about stranger danger, but at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. The lady continued talking about stuff, like how the boys have go-karts, and they like to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very entertaining for a seven-year-old kid, and at this point, I trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some kids my age. Then I remembered that I needed to ask my mom first. I told her this. She told me that was no problem, that they lived just up the road. My mom shouldn't mind. It started raining harder, and she opened the sliding door of the van and said something like, Now, let's get you out of this rain and go find your mommy. I knew logically that I shouldn't do this, but this lady seemed really nice, and I was desperately wanting to get out of the rain as I walked toward to the open door of the van. I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. This set off alarm bells in my head that something wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I looked up at the fat man, who was not only staring at me with this menacing glare, but he had this really creepy toothy smile, and his teeth were stained a dark yellow. I could pick up a very fucked up vibe from him. I knew now that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up. Her demeanor had changed. She was being demanding and trying to literally push me into the van. She sounded angry and said, get in already, in a tone. That was the complete opposite of how she had sounded before. I jumped the side and started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab my arm or wrist, but somehow I was able to quickly break free and run back to the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said, she was very overweight. I made it back to my mom. Who was freaking out? I tried to explain what had happened to me, but I don't think that at seven years old, I was able to convey the gravity of what had happened to me, and I didn't fully understand it myself. This happened about ten years ago, in the area between Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. My friend, we'll call him R. And I used to regularly go to Tacoma to sing karaoke at a bar there. To be honest, I don't think I've ever seen the city of Tacoma during the day. Anyways, so it's about 1 or 2 in the morning, and we're heading back to Seattle, and we have to stop for gas. He pulls over at this station, and I'm buzzed, 
and feeling good. So this creepy station doesn't even register with me. As I'm sitting, messing with the radio, suddenly my door swings open. I only saw a flash of him, because it was all blindingly quick. But he was kinda middle height, dark skinned, liked too much tanning, had a blank stare, tethered clothes. I remember he had a black jacket on too, like leather or something, but it was torn and holy. So here I am, trying to pull the door closed, and I'm realizing this man is very strong. He honestly won the tug of war with me, trying to slam the door closed. If my adrenaline hadn't kicked in, I don't know. I do finally manage to get it closed after maybe what was only a few seconds and immediately started looking around for my friend, panicked and confused. R has already been yelling at the guy to get the F away from my car. Surprisingly, the man listens. R isn't the most intimidating looking guy or anything, but maybe the guy didn't want to cause a scene. I don't recall there being anyone else. Don't recall there being anyone else outside the station with us at night. But R was being very loud and forceful. So I'm watching the man walk away and he's not looking back at us or making a sound that I can hear, which is what made the entire thing more unusual. R gets back in the car and he's usually calm, but like a deadpan, like when you see something terrible, but you're too scared to move. I look to see where he's looking and he's looking at the creepy guy was now facing us with that same emotionless stare just watching us leave the pump and back towards the streets my eyes are on him the entire time too we book it out of there and that was the end of that to this day i don't stop at gas stations at night at all if i can help it unless none of the car is there or it's on a busy street to the guy who tried to get into my friend's car that night I hope you turn your life of crime around, but still, let's not meet again. I'm a 23-year-old female. At the time this happened, I was 19 and homeless in a big city. I recently moved to that city and was on my way back to the shelter from the public library, my favorite place to hang out during the day. I was taking a shortcut through an alley wide enough for a car to go through. I noticed an old beat up car come to the alley and drive slowly behind me. I figured that they probably didn't feel like they had enough room to pass me, so I picked up the pace and crossed the street. They drove on the same side of the street that I was on and kept pace with me. There was just one guy in the vehicle, looked to be in his mid-twenties and Hispanic. He rolled down his window and said, Hey, are you okay? How old are you? I looked like I was just about 14, and I'm pretty short, so I got that question a lot. I just responded, I'm fine. I'm not a minor if that's what you're asking. He asked me if I needed a ride, and I politely declined. Then he starts telling me that he's just concerned and wanted to talk. He really insisted and smiled through almost the entire interaction. It was very off-putting how much he was smiling. I asked him why we couldn't just talk on the street where we were, and he dodges the question and asked me again if I'm sure that I don't want to ride. My gut was telling me that he had bad intentions, and if I were as young as I looked, I might have fallen for it. Instead, I looked around me to make sure I wasn't going to get ambushed and walked up to his passenger window. I told him the most threatening voice I could muster, I know you don't really want to talk. I'm sure you have worse things in mind. I paused and took another look around. And I've memorized your license plate. I'm going to go straight to the police station. I better not see you again. I never saw him again. Unfortunately though, I forgot to write down his plate number. I actually did memorize them. And the shelter curfew was going in effect soon. So I didn't have time to file a report at the station. It didn't occur to me to call the non-emergency number. I also purchased as large of a knife as I could legally carry for self-defense. This happened about 20 years ago. I was 9 at the time, but my parents have also told me their side of the story on a bunch of different occasions 
so that should help. My parents are both biologists. They met at work and from there, it's history. The place where they worked at the time was a government building dedicated to biology research using government projects towards the public, meaning they were the ones studying the environment and making the environment protection laws around their studies. This being a massive old government building, it also had a security guard present day and night. During the day, the security guard would mostly just stay in reception and greet people. But at night, they would do their rounds and make sure that there was no intruders because of all the science equipment and computers kept in the building. One of these guards is the let's not meet guy. Initially, he seemed like the nicest person. He was always nice to me and frankly, all the memories I have of him before this were very nice. He'd greet me and talk to me in the nicest way every time my parents brought me to work. He would make me paper planes, which he was surprisingly good at and throw them all around with me. And he would stay with me at reception in the days my parents had to work into the night. Obviously for me that got really boring, really really fast. So he would keep me in company and entertain me. Mostly he would just talk, play with paper planes, and watch TV. It all seemed nice enough. Nice enough for my parents to trust him with me, which was probably their biggest mistake. One night, my parents had to work even later than usual. I think it was around 10 p.m. and they were still at it. So this guy, who was on the night shift, decided to take me around the building with him to do rounds. We started on the top floor checking all the rooms and exterior part of the roof. Every room was so dark that I'd always stay a little bit behind and wait for him to turn the lights on. Then he stepped down to the second floor where my parents' labs were. We checked the opposite side of the building, going into the labs with the massive extractors, microscopes, and every kind of science equipment you may think of. We walked down the stairs to the first floor, where most of the administration rooms were. I still remember seeing maps on the walls with embalmed fish everywhere serving as decorations. First floor was all clear, so it was time to check the two basement levels. I thought it would have made sense to check the labs on the right side first as the left side had a flight of stairs at the end leading up to where my parents were, but for some reason he decided that we would check that side first. We checked all the labs, but I noticed his pace was accelerating, and he was starting to look and sound happier, excited even. Once again, we checked all the labs, all the corners from one end to the other, turning the lights on ahead of us and turning them off behind us when we left. When we got to the last lab area, he turned all the lights on and went inside. There were three separate offices on each side of the lab. And on the first one, he hurried towards the printer, opened it up, took out two pieces of paper, and made two quick paper planes. That's when everything changed. He picked up one of the planes, went outside the office, and threw it towards the end of the room. Then he told me the one he just threw was mine and that we could throw them all around there. I ran to the other side of the room to pick up the plane, excited to play with it, and suddenly the lights went off. When I turned to check what was happening, I saw him getting out of the lab, turning the lights off, and locking the door. I ran to the door, punched and kicked at it while screaming for him to open it, panic taking over me because of how scared I was of being in the dark at the time. Through the glass door, I could see him scurrying away in the corridors, turning the lights off as he went, disappearing and turning the corner. I'm pretty sure everything I felt and every shadow and every creeping monster I saw in there while waiting was a part of my imagination because of how scared I was. I balled up against the corner and I could see a shadow moving around in the dark. I could only cry, lost, without knowing what was happening and why he was doing that. My parents finished up their work eventually and when they did, they packed up their things and made their way to the lobby to pick me up and go home. When they got there, the security guard was at reception and I was nowhere to be found. They panicked, of course. Must have shouted a hundred different cuss words at the guy, and I'm not sure how my dad didn't murder him right there and then. But when they first asked the guy where the hell I was and what he had done with me, he simply said that he had done his rounds with me and I must have gotten lost somewhere. 
This building would take you about an hour and a half check from top to bottom, even if you're rushing. So, must have gotten lost somewhere. It's not exactly helpful. They looked for hours without finding me. It was only when I saw the light at the far end of the corridors leading to the lab I was in that I got the courage to stand up, rush towards the door and start punching it as hard as I could. They finally found me in there and made the guard unlock the door to get me out. I don't really remember sleeping that night, and if I did, it must have been out of exhaustion. But I know I made my mom stay in my bedroom with me the entire night. Of course, my parents made a complaint against the guard, and when they did, the guy started being investigated. He was later fired and arrested, not for locking me away, where he probably hoped no one would find me, but because he was partnering up with other criminals to steal computers and equipment from the building to sell in some shady market with all the information in the hard drives and make money off of it. By then, he had stole a lot of the old computers without anyone realizing, and who knows what his plans were for me that night. I'm not convinced that locking a crying child in the middle of the darkness, hidden away in a room, is exactly the most normal behavior if you're not trying to hide them and come get them later when everyone else has left and sell them as part of your product. Luckily, he never had a chance to do that, and I really hope he never got to do that to any other kid. I was around the age of 7 years old and I was playing in my cousin's backyard when a man started to talk to me from the other side of the fence. He told me that he was one of my cousins, which I immediately knew wasn't true. He told me that I should come with him and he wants to have a lot of fun with me and he loves me. I ran back inside my cousin's house and told my mom and my aunt what just happened and they both looked out the window and could see that this guy had already gone. I then described what the man looked like to them and they told me that they never had a cousin that looked like him. I think they thought I made it up because now when I ask them about it, they say, Oh wait, that actually happened? I thought you just wanted attention. It's so creepy thinking about a grown man who I didn't even know telling a seven-year-old me that he loves me. Shuck, I can only imagine what he meant. Here's a bit of context for the post. I grew up about 15 miles outside of downtown Portland in a semi-rural area. We lived on a windy country road in the hills where the homes were spread quite a distance apart. Our closest neighbor was maybe about a 10 minute walk away. Our house was set off in the back of the road and had a gravel driveway that took a sharp turn so you couldn't see the house from the road and vice versa. One warm spring day when I was 10, I was riding the bus home from school. As the bus squeaked to a stop at my driveway, I looked out the window to my left and saw a man in a gray pickup idling alongside the road, parked perpendicular to my driveway, almost blocking it. Being so young, I thought nothing of it, but when I got to the front of the bus, the driver held out his arm blocking me from going any further. Do you recognize that truck or that man? I told her no. At this point, she opened the door, sliding the window, and motioned for him moving along. He looked at her, then looked away, and didn't move. He wasn't looking at a map or anything, only sitting there. The bus driver then got on an intercom and told him that he needs to move along, but he continued to stay there. Then she said, Sir, you best move along. I'm not going anywhere until you get out of here. He finally left, and after a few minutes, the bus driver let me out and she said that she'll wait several minutes for me to get up my driveway to my home. I told my mom what happened as soon as I got home, and the next morning she came with me to catch the bus and to thank the driver. I believe she gave her some sort of gift, but I'm not sure exactly. After that incident, my mom and stepdad hauled out a section of trees at the end of the driveway as a hiding spot. In that spot, my siblings and I would watch the road, while waiting for the bus in the mornings, while nobody could see us. Anyway, this incident gives me chills when I think back. If my bus driver hadn't been so vigilant in looking out for me, and if this man in the pickup had been up to no good, I would be a goner. Right after my driveway, there's a sharp turn and a steep hill, and the bus would have been out of sight within seconds. There would have been no witnesses.
I used to work at a little bagel shop in my hometown a few years back. I believe I was 17 at the time. The shop opened at 6 a.m., so an opening shift started solo at 5 a.m., with your second opener showing up 30 minutes later. On this particular morning, I'm scheduled for the solo open, and my good friend, we can call her Amanda, was the second opener. Around this time of the year, it was still pitch black that early in the morning, and we weren't allowed to park in the business parking, because being that it was a small business, and the spaces were prioritized for customers, so I had a short walk through the dark from the side street to get to the back gate of the shop. Anyways, I hop out of my car, lock it behind me and start heading towards the building and almost instantly after I lock my car, I see a figure pop out of the bushes of the neighboring building. It's a man dressed all in black with a baseball cap on. He starts down the sidewalk adjacent to me and I tell myself that he's probably just an innocent homeless guy using the bathroom in the bushes. Maybe he got embarrassed when he saw me coming and stood up. Stupid I know, but I keep my keys in hand and an eye on him. As I get closer towards the building, every time I peer over at him, he's already staring at me, making no effort to hide it. At this point, I pick up the pace, and he does the same. As I'm about to reach the parking lot, he shifts off the sidewalk and is now headed through the lot straight towards me. This is when I start to panic and realize the severity of the situation. For a split second, I just pause and completely stop walking. I knew I wasn't close enough to be able to outrun him to the gate. With him crossing the parking lot, he would beat me there. But I also didn't have much confidence in my ability to outrun him back to my car. In that same moment, I guess he sees me second guessing myself and took the opportunity to begin full sprinting towards me. I see him grab something from his pocket and running back to the car becomes my only option because 17 year old me would have to juke out a grown man who possibly has a weapon to make it to that gate. I don't think I've ever ran so fast in my life, literally ran like my life depended on it, and I could hear his feet smacking the road right behind me. I didn't scream or yell for help, I just remember thinking to myself, get to the fucking car, and by some means I made it to the door and was able to lock myself inside. It was weird to me that he didn't even try to get into my car or pull the door. He kind of just stepped back, breathing all heavily, staring at me through my window before running back towards the back of the building and hopping a gated fence, which is where we unlock to get inside the building. I started my car and called 911. The operator told me to wait at the nearest open business, which was a Starbucks, and the cops would call me back when they had checked out the surrounding area. I started driving that way and I'm like, oh fuck. I remember that Amanda will be showing up any minute now and walk into the back where a dude might still be hiding. I call her and she says he's pulling up to work. I tell her don't get out of the car and give her the rundown of what just happened and we meet up at Starbucks and wait for the cops to call us back. They check it out and he's gone. They stay while we open, get whatever info they still needed and take off. We were both pretty shaken up for the rest of the day, and the more we discuss, the worse we feel. Amanda tells me that earlier in the week she remembers a man coming in right before closing and asking her questions that rubbed her the wrong way. Just stuff like saying he noticed that we didn't have any male employees, asking how many people usually work every day. If you guys open at 6, you must have to get here real early, huh? And some other offhanded stuff. She said when she left, he was sitting outside eating his food and saw her come from the back gate and lock up. She remembered what the man looked like, but the guy's face was a blur for me after how fast everything happened. We both assumed that it has to be the same man, but who knows. Going forward from that day, my boss started scheduling us to open in pairs at 5.30 instead of 5.00 and you weren't allowed to go inside until your partner had arrived. We never had an issue like that again, but I've definitely cried and had major panic attacks every day for a couple of weeks afterwards, thinking about what could have happened. So, fuck you, Bushman.
This happened to me when I was a sophomore at high school, about 12 years ago. My girlfriend at the time, Katie, and I were hanging out at the park in town. This was a rather big park with a stream running down the middle of it and fully tucked away shaded areas that were perfect for high school kids to hide away and do what we did. We lived in a relatively small town of about 20,000 people and there had recently been a string of kidnappings. Three of our fellow classmates, all girls, had been kidnapped, driven up to a canyon, and then bewilderedly let go on the side of the road. Law enforcement had came to our school and they held an assembly where they told us that the kidnapper was a Hispanic male in his 30s and drove an old white two-door sedan. Flash forward to the park. After we were done gallivanting in the trees, we were sitting on a bench by the street just talking when a white car pulled up across from us and parked. I turned to Katie and teased, white car over there, that is probably the kidnapper, and we both laughed. The sun was setting, we decided it was best to get home. I told Katie I just needed to go to the bathroom before we left, because I needed to poop and I didn't want to do that at her house. I went to the park bathroom that was right by the bench where we were sitting at and did my business. It's important to mention that this was before we had smartphones and just had one of those sliding cell phones, so I didn't spend my whole bathroom time scrolling or looking through my phone, but rather just in my thoughts. I came out of the bathroom and noticed Katie was gone. I called her name and looked around the bathroom building. I thought maybe she too had decided to use the bathroom. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone in the trees walking up the hill from the stream I assumed it was Katie, and I walked down towards the individual. As I got closer, I noticed it was definitely not Katie, but a man who looked fidgety. I figured he might have seen where Katie went, so I yelled, Hey! to catch his attention and ask him. Instead of turning towards me, he bolted. For some reason, I ran towards him. I have to mention that I'm a pretty big guy. I am about 6'2" and in high school, weighed about 225. I played linebacker for the football team, so I was pretty muscly, in shape, and fast. I closed on the guy pretty fast and slowed down because I just wanted to talk to him. He slowed down as I got closer, and we were only a few feet from the white car. I asked him, have you seen a girl that I was sitting with a few minutes ago? He responded in broken English, I know see no girl, sorry. And then he got into his white car. He turned it on and peeled away quickly. It was at that point my dumb teenager brain finally decided to pull out my phone and text Katie. When I did, I noticed I had 11 missed calls from her and five from her aunt, who she lived with. I quickly called back. She answered and said, Where are you? I asked her what was going on and she told me the story. As soon as I had gone into the bathroom, the man in the car got out and walked towards her, saying, Excuse me, miss. Come here. Katie instincts kicked in and she ran. The man yelled, You know run from me, bitch, and chased her. Katie was a regional champion track runner, and she managed to outrun him into the park and get to her house, which was only about a block and a half away. She told her aunt and uncle what happened, and they tried to call me while her uncle called the cops. I walked to her house and she hugged me super tight. Eventually the cops came and we gave them our statements. My next door neighbor who was a cop told me that they eventually found out that the car was stolen, but they did not find the man. There also weren't any more kidnappings in our hometown after that. I'm grateful that the kidnapper was a smaller guy who obviously was a bit of a wimp and that didn't have a weapon. I'm also grateful that my girlfriend was damn fast and her home was close by or the story could have ended much differently. When I was around 7 years old, my mom and I lived in an apartment in a border town. My mom's a single mother. Anyway, in our apartment complex, like most, it had a playground. Luckily, our apartment was on the bottom floor and right next to the playground. Like most children, I loved playing there. I honestly can't remember, but my mom either went inside the apartment to grab something or let me play alone 
but once she did, some random lady approached me. I've never seen this lady before, but she told me she had a huge Barbie doll house and a lot of toy Barbies. She told me she lived not too far away and asked if I wanted to go play. I remember saying, I have to ask my mom first, and that's when she said that she knew my mom and it's okay. I didn't know any better and I agreed to go. She grabbed my hand and led me to her house. She did have a lot of Barbie toys and I was playing with them, but she didn't have any children around so I'm not sure why she had all these dolls. Apparently I was gone for some time because it started getting dark and that's when I heard loud bangs at the door. The lady opened the door and it was my mom. She looked so frightened. She grabbed me and we moved out of the apartment soon after that happened and I honestly don't remember what happened after that. This memory came back to me not too long ago and my mom told me that was the worst thing that ever happened but I don't remember feeling afraid. Who knows what this lady had planned for me since we live five minutes away from the Mexican border and it's known for trafficking children, I could have easily been taken to Mexico and never seen again. My mom did tell me the reason she found me was because a bystander saw me walk off with that lady and then saw my mom frantically looking for me. I've read through some stories here. A lot of them remind me of a time when I was a kid and I had a scary interaction. So it was winter time and it snowed recently. Everything was covered in nice pickable snow and me and my dad were making snowmen together. I was super young in a pink snow coat and purple hat. I was obviously a kid. My dad needed something from inside or he got tired and decided to let me play a bit longer while he warms up inside so he left me alone. I'm from a super small town where everyone knows everyone and it's pretty safe normally. And I was in sight from the kitchen window, so my parents felt safe to leave me outside for a bit of time. Apparently, this was more sketchy than anticipated. I remember rolling up snow for a snowman and a van pulling up in front of me. It looked like a white minivan with a lady in the passenger seat. They asked me if I'd seen a puppy and said that their puppy had just ran away. I can't remember what the puppy's name was, but I'm pretty sure it was something generic like Buddy or Bandit. This is where I think back on this and my alarm bells are ringing. The woman asked me if I would like to go in her van and help them look for the lost puppy and that they really missed their dog. They asked me a few times before my dad, thankfully, saw that someone was talking to me in the yard and he asked the lady why she would be talking to a kid alone. And the lady and whoever else was in the car just drove away. Unfortunately, it seems that small towns are more of a target than I would think. We had an ice cream man try to convince a few kids to get into his truck for free ice cream a year or two after the lady lost her dog. Years ago, I was wandering around downtown in a city I was familiar with. I ran into another person wandering the casino outside and we instantly started talking. He was a handsome man around my age that I'd never seen or met before. So we talked and he invited me to smoke at his spot. We had no car and we needed to get a ride to his spot. And now I'm in a car going to a place I've never been before with someone I just met. Okay, whatever, I'm having fun, right? Yet I recall the driver just looking at me in a way that caught my attention. He was looking at me as to see if he recognized me. We get to his house and we are excited because we're about to smoke. We walk into his house and he led me to a room. With the door slightly open, I noticed someone just laying in bed in the next door across from where I sat and the person didn't move. He told me to get comfortable and he left to go get some weed from the guy who was in the bedroom down the hall. I look around the room and I notice that there was a lot of kids movies, a TV, and bars and blackened window. I looked at the door and there was only a lock on it, no knob, and the lock needed a key to open it and shut. I immediately stood up, grabbed what little I could of the lock to open the door, enough to quietly get out. 
I walked to the living room where a lady sat quietly with a child staring at a TV. I unlocked the front door and opened it. And he shouted, Get back here! I ran to an open gate around the yard and screamed. I ran across a busy street to an auto parts store and asked if I could use the phone. I called a friend and rambled a conversation in desperate need to calm down. I honestly believe I escaped a really bad environment that I might not have been seen from again if I didn't follow my instincts. This morning, I just got out of class and was headed home. I then saw a crippled old lady begging for help and telling me that she needed to get into her apartment. I helped her, took her to an elevator and took her to her door. To my surprise, the door was wide open. When I went inside, she told me if I could go to a nearby shop to buy her some wine and some cigarettes. She proceeded to give me her credit card and keys and insisted on the fact that I should leave my bag in her house. I said no thank you. Even though the situation was weird, it wasn't that that scared me the most. It was inside of the apartment. There were no decorations, pictures, or anything. It was disgusting. There was some kind of chair with excrements on it, and the walls were filled with cracks. I got scared, took the card and keys, tried to act normal, and then wanted to test if it was a real card. I went to the store and the cashier said the card wasn't a real one. It was at that moment I decided not to go to her house and gave the keys and card to the police. A friend of mine told me that she saw the same exact lady saying the same exact thing and the scariest thing is that she saw a man bring her outside then immediately go inside the apartment. The area she was in is known for being dangerous. There was recently a shooting between drug dealers in daylight for example. A bit of a backstory, I'm 18 and a leader in the Boy Scouts of America troop. The troop I'm affiliated with is about 50 minutes from where I live and to get there I'd have to go through a larger town, 50k plus people. This town is split in half by a river and the part of the city north of the river is considered to be a rougher part of town and higher homeless population. After the scout meeting I drove around town to see the Christmas lights and eventually made my way into the rougher area. I drove past some nice decorations and then turned down a side street. There were street lights at every intersection, but it was nearly pitch black in between the street right where the alley is. As I turned, I see someone in a black coat just standing in the middle of the road where the alley is with their arms at their side. They start walking towards me really slowly and raised one of their arms up in the air like they were signaling me. I had recently watched a video where a young woman waved a car down on a dark road and had people with her that had what I could only guess were some evil intentions. As soon as I saw this person in the darkest part of the street, my blood ran cold and I backed up and drove away as fast as I could while paralyzed in fear. In hindsight, I probably could have called the police dispatch to see if this person actually needed help, but who knows. Context. I was 9 years old and it was mid-July summer in its prime, and I remember it being the best time of my life. It was very popular for all the kids to meet up at the neighborhood park. We would always be playing basketball. And on this particular day, the sun was as hot as ever. Everyone started going home when the sun was starting to set, and soon I was the last one at the park. I usually waited for everyone to leave because I like playing by myself. After 10 minutes of me playing, there was a man that came to the park. He was wearing a red shirt, hat, sketchers, and a backpack with a teddy bear. I was shooting the ball, but I completely airballed. The man comes down from the park, sprinting, and hands me the ball saying, Really nice ball you got there. I have some more in my house if you want to come. I remember the one rule my parents always taught me to follow. It was to never trust someone you didn't know. So I just asked for my ball back. He got really mad, then said no, and ended up walking away. I ended up going home, not telling anyone, eventually forgetting about the whole situation until about three years later at one of my baseball games at the park. 
I saw the man at the end of the fence staring at me. I was up to bat and it just lost focus because it all hit me. All those years ago, that man was trying to get me into his house and now he shows up to my game. This is where it gets really weird and I wasn't paying attention at all when the pitcher threw the ball and I got clocked right in the face and got knocked out. I wake up 15 seconds later to see if the man is gone and he was. I haven't seen that man ever since. This is something I'll never forget and it haunts me to this day. When I turned 9, my parents finally let me start walking to school. It wasn't far and even though they were worried, I assured them that I'd be fine. I was so excited because my best friend lived next door and that meant we could walk to school together every day. Things were going great for the first few weeks and we had so much fun laughing and talking all the way to school and back home. There was this liquor store along the way that we would stop at on the way home to get snacks and candies but only on Fridays. It was our little secret and the thing we looked forward to at the end of the week. One Friday afternoon we began our walk to the liquor store talking about school as usual. It was just like any other time we went to the store. We would rush in laughing all the way to the candy, pick our favorites, and hop in line to pay. This time there was a man with a pack of beer and he looked like he worked in construction or something. He was in line before us with another man, but when he saw us, he let us go first. We thought he was just being nice, so we happily obliged. And as I talked to the cashier, my friend stayed behind me. I could hear the two men speaking in Spanish and laughing, so I turned to look and see my friend with a nervous look on her face. She grabbed my arm after I paid and practically pulled me out of the store. I kept asking her what was wrong and she said she didn't feel safe and we should run home. I was confused and I wanted us to enjoy our candy on the way back like we always did until she told me what she had heard. I don't speak Spanish but she did and apparently the two men were talking about me. She said that one of them pointed to me and said, She looks like the one. They both laughed and agreed, and the one with his beer said, Let's follow them so we can grab her around the corner. She's small and won't put up a fight. I froze in fear. We were still in the parking lot of the store and we didn't know what to do. We looked around us and saw the two men getting into a big work truck. They didn't even glance our way, so I told my friend that they were probably joking and we were just paranoid for being scared. Boy was I wrong. My friend didn't agree with me and said that they were definitely serious and we should start running. I was hesitant at first until I turned around and the truck was right behind us. I took one look at my friend and we grabbed hands and ran as fast as we could. Our hearts were racing and we didn't dare turn around. We were both crying and I ended up dropping my bag of candy. We turned the corner and there was the truck. My heart dropped. The man in the passenger seat hopped out and began to approach us. He didn't say a word. His eyes were just locked on me. I have never been that terrified in my life. I was frozen in fear. My friend however started yelling at the man in Spanish and he seemed to get angry. There was a busy road to the left of us and it was our only way out. We knew what we had to do without even saying it. We didn't look left or right, we just ran for our lives across traffic. A car almost ended up hitting us but they slammed on the brakes and started honking. We just kept running until we were a block away from our houses. We were out of breath and hysterical. We thought we had made it until we heard a whistle. There was a truck. The men were on the other side of the street, windows down, whistling at us. We had no option but to run as fast as we could to our house. My mom was in the front gardening and she was shocked to see us running and screaming. We couldn't get the words out right. All we managed to say was that there was a truck following us. My mom immediately ran to the street to see the truck peel away. As soon as she calmed us down, she called the cops to take a report, but nothing ever came of it, and I was never allowed to walk to school again. So I think I almost got kidnapped today. I can't even believe I'm typing that. I had finished work early on Friday and was excited for the weekend. 
I left work around 3.30 p.m. and started walking to my car. It was about a one kilometer walk to my car and you have to go down this creepy alley that's about 200 meters long. So just before I got to this alleyway, this man out of nowhere said, you're so beautiful. And I was straight away creeped out, but he was walking in the opposite direction, so I just kept going. Then about 50 meters down this alley, I turned and I saw him there walking like a creep just staring at me. So I started walking faster and then he started speed walking. I can't really even explain it. At this point, I just sprinted and then he sprinted. I didn't think, I was just glad that I had my keys already. Luckily, I got into my car and started it and just went. He stopped running then, but I just feel empty. I cried a lot on the way home and then took a shower because I felt dirty, but now I feel empty. The story is from a while ago in my past. I'm a female and at the time I was 14 years old. My mom dropped me off at the local mall during the day to meet up with some friends. My friends had not arrived yet so I continued on by myself and window shopped a bit. For context, I grew up in an area with plenty of human trafficking only a few hour drive from the border. As I was walking down the rows of stores, this man in his mid to late 20s approached me and struck up a conversation. It was polite at first, flirty. He mentioned how beautiful I was and how attracted he was to me. For additional context, I was right in the middle of puberty, starved for attention and in a very awkward phase of my physical appearance. This man kept complimenting my appearance and eventually grabbed my hand. He kept saying that his family lives in California and he wants me to come live with him and his family. He was mentioning marriage and how much his mom would love me and how much I would love California. At this point, I knew something was off, but my meek self couldn't figure out how to say no and exit the situation. The man's tone started increasing in urgency when he was asking me to come with him. He really wanted me to come to California with him, despite me being half his age. The man said, You have to come with me right now. At this point, I didn't like that he had a hold of my hand. I said, I have to go, my mom is going to be here soon. And I bolted into the nearest store. I never saw the man again. Did I call the authorities about this? No, but I should have. Did I tell my parents about this? Of course not. I wouldn't ever be allowed to go to the mall again if they knew this happened. I live in a small city. We are a college town, but otherwise pretty boring, yet I've almost been kidnapped two times, and both times were saved by sheer luck. The first time was when I was in elementary school. A friend and I were walking up the road that ran along our apartment complex headed to a gas station for some snacks and drinks. It was near sunset but not nearly dark yet. A van pulled up next to us and started slowing down. There were two men in front and one in the back. My friend noticed before I did and pulled out her flip phone. They weren't common at this point. The moment she pulls it up, the van takes off and out of there. The second time was only a few years ago, in my early 20s. It was about 3 a.m. and I was walking home on what would have just become a Tuesday because we held D&D &D Monday nights and it usually ran late. The place our dungeon master lived was two blocks down from my house, so typically I wasn't worried about the walk. I got about a block away and I hear a garage door open loudly behind me. The particular house it was attached to had a boarded up door and several boarded windows. It certainly didn't look like anyone lived there. Then I start to hear footsteps behind me. Not very fast, but I wasn't far away, so they could easily outpace me with my small legs. Then out of nowhere, a truck pulled onto the road. They stopped and turned on their brights, basically stopping my follower in their tracks. They watched and made sure that I got home safe and wasn't followed for the rest of the way home. One of the scariest nights of my life by far.
Years ago, when I was 18 or 19, I went to an anime convention with some of my friends and we stayed at a hotel that was tucked away from everyone else. The road was set up in a T-junction with the longer part connecting to the main road. On one side being our hotel cluster and the other side was pitch dark that went under a bridge and didn't look like it had an end to it. Some of my friends got lost trying to meet me midway so I decided to walk to the main road instead which was about a half mile away because this area wasn't too well lit and once I made it to the main road they would be able to see me better. So I'm on the side of the sidewalk going in the direction of traffic if there had been cars out but it was 11 at night and at this time this hotel wasn't well known so there were no cars on the road. As I'm walking horizontal from the hotel to get to the intersection that would take me to the road to connect me to the main road, a white van pulls up beside me and starts slowly driving along with me. There's a man in the front seat and he asks me where I'm going, which is of course the main street. And I let him know that I'm heading over to the gas station in the corner. The sliding side door opens and there's another man in the car. The back seats were all completely removed the back portion of the van had a vinyl flooring or something to that effect and a white hard outdoor plastic chair sitting in the back. Both men kept asking me where I was going and if they could give me a ride and how it wasn't safe out here and that they could give me a lift to the shop that I needed to go to. It was super fortunate that after the first minute or so, some cars came down the road and one of the cars slowed down and started flashing their lights. I then crossed so that I was on the opposite side of them and proceeded to run to the gas station without stopping. The mental imagery of that van showing up and the interior will never leave my mind. What in the actual fuck? Me, my best friend, her girlfriend, and my boyfriend were walking home from dinner and stopped at a 7-Eleven. My boyfriend wanted a couple of beers, so we waited outside while he got what he needed. As we were outside, I noticed a girl with a backpack walking around the parking lot. She walked up to another girl who was on the phone, and the girl on the phone said to whoever she was talking to, Yeah, my home girl here, one second, and proceeded to tell the girl to sit in the car occupied by a large man while she went inside. I noticed the male and the girl looking at us from the car while the other girl was still on the phone inside. I specifically noticed that the male said something and pointed and the girl laughed at us while looking at us. Here's where things get sketchy. The girl in the car gets out of the car and comes up to my friend. She asks her if she has a pen and paper. My friend tells her that she has a pen but no paper and we didn't have any either. Here's how the conversation went after she retrieved the pen. Where do you live? The trailer park behind here? No, but nearby. Oh, okay, my grandma lives here. Where do you work? My friend tells her where she works. Oh really? I know that place. My sister used to work there. What's your name again? You look familiar. My friend gives her her name. Oh yeah, I knew you looked familiar. My friend had never seen her before and gave a slight chuckle. Then the girl says, how far until you're home? At this time, my boyfriend came out of the store. The moment he did, the girl instantly wrapped up the conversation and quickly retreated back to the car saying, well, thanks for the pen, not even returning it, nor did she write anything the entire time. She also kept trying to touch my friend. I did notice that, specifically at her wrist. The girl also had a hospital band on. I also noticed that the man watched us the entire interaction and said something to the girl the minute she opened the car door. He seemed frustrated at her. They watched us until we walked off a minute or two later. Then they proceeded to sit in the car for at least three minutes. At least that's how long it took until they were out of my sight. Probably longer since they made no effort to pull off. Is this sketchy to anyone else? Has someone heard of this type of thing before? I'm especially worried as my friend doesn't have a car and walks everywhere. Second post here, starting to feel more comfortable sharing my life experiences. One morning around 
Pre-pandemic, I decided to go to Walmart to get some necessities before the crazy weekend Walmart frenzy. It was fairly empty at this time on a Saturday. I went dressed in a giant Pink Floyd tee and jean shorts, some boots, no makeup. And I'll say this now, I've been mistaken as a high schooler when I was actually 23 at the time. So I'm minding my own business walking down to the shampoo aisle and I see a creepy older man standing on the right. Didn't think much of it, just passing by him. As I passed him, he grabbed my arm and said, Hey, let's go get coffee. This is the first time something like this has ever happened to me. So I was shocked and said, What? His voice was distorted and I thought that he had some speech or mental problems. He kept repeating the same thing while pulling me forcefully until I snapped out of my shock, took his hand off of mine, and yelled for him not to touch me and to leave me alone. After I walked away, I walked into a random aisle to see if he would follow me, and sure enough, he did. My anger got the best of me, and I screamed so loud for him to stop following me. I found the manager and told him what happened, and even he was freaked out. He let all the employees know, and I had someone escort me to my car. Ladies need to stay alert and safe, and don't have to be polite towards people like this. He probably thought I was younger than what I was or something. Not sure what would have happened if I went to get coffee with him. Stay safe, everyone. Now this is pretty tame compared to all the other stories here. But it wasn't until recently, at the age of 20, that I realized that I was probably almost abducted. The details are short since I was very young and I think I blocked out most of it. I was about 6 or 7 playing outside alone. I grew up in a very safe neighborhood so it wasn't uncommon for me to play outside unattended. I was drawing on a sidewalk with chalk when a car pulled up beside me. It looked like it was a middle aged man saying, Hey little girl come here and I stupidly stood up and walked over to see what he wanted. He goes, Do you like puppies? Of course, what little girl doesn't like puppies? So I said yes, and he goes, Well, I lost my puppy, and I've been looking for him. If you come with me to help look, you can pet him when I find him. I was like, fuck yeah, and go, Yeah, let me ask my mom if I can come, and turned around and bolted towards the house to go ask, because I knew I had to ask before I went somewhere. But I heard him speed off and my stupid brain went, hmm, he must have seen his dog ahead. And then I just went inside. I thought of this recently and realized that this man's motives were not innocent here. When I was six, I went with my mom, uncle, and grandparents to the airport. My grandparents were taking an international flight. This was in the late 80s, so this meant we were allowed to walk all the way to the gate and wait for my grandparents right before they boarded the plane. Times have changed and this is no longer allowed. My mom was sitting with my grandparents having a conversation. My uncle was off getting coffee somewhere. Being six years old, I became bored of sitting and started wandering off a little. My mom called me to her and gave me the stranger danger talk and how I needed to stay with them. My attitude was, yeah, whatever. Again, my mom got distracted by my grandparents' questions and I began to wander off again. I peeked my head and looked down the hallway. There were people coming and going. Less than 15 feet from me, I saw a creepy man, long brown hair to his waist, dressed in black leather head to toe, beard and a mustache. He was about to open a door, which I'm assuming now was a bathroom. As he's opening the door, he looked right at me and waved his finger for me to come over there. I immediately thought of the conversation my mom just had with me a few minutes ago, plus the sky looked evil, so I immediately turned and ran back to my mom. I said, Guess what mom, a stranger was trying to take me, you were right. I don't remember her taking me very seriously. She was helping my grandparents with their tickets and wasn't paying too much attention. When it was time to leave, I took a quick peek down the hall and he was gone. I think to this day what would have happened if I went to him, if my mom didn't talk to me about strangers just a few minutes before. I know that this wouldn't have turned out good.
I was about 8 or 9 years old walking home from my best friend's house back to my home. A guy pulled up beside me wearing a police uniform. Seemed totally legit but who knows. But he was driving a super shitty sedan like one of those old Buick like boats. He was really aggressive and assertive telling me to get in the car that I need to go with him right now. He told me that my dad was in the hospital and sent him to get me. My mom was in an accident, but he is here to take me to her. I totally lost my cool, felt super sketched out, and I burst out crying. This guy shouted at me to get into his car. I panicked and just started sprinting all the way home. I get home and my dad is watering the garden, cool as anything, and I'm completely losing my mind, absolutely hysterical. He calms me down, hears the story, and calls 911. He gives him the description, and sure enough, they catch a guy with a 13-year-old girl in the back seat who he managed to talk into going with him. Some background to this. I'm an 18-year-old female, and I live in Sydney, Australia. I was 15 at the time. I went to the local beach by myself and was just sitting there sun tanning. I had a podcast going, ironically, about a murder case, and I had my sunsies on. The beach is probably a kilometer long, and I was in a very quaint and quiet part. There were a group of two boys about 50 meters away from me, but that was about it. So I'm laying there when this man walks over. He seemed to be about 30 years old. He starts talking about how I look beautiful in my red bikini. He had a very thick accent, and I just said, oh thanks, and he sat down next to me. I had an instant gut feeling that something was wrong. He starts talking to me about how he's a tourist and kept trying to get to know me. I gave him some advice on bars around, but he said, aren't you still in high school? So he obviously knew I was young. Anyway, this went on for 20 minutes and he started talking, practically begging for me to come over to his house for a few drinks. I kept saying no and was looking for a way out. This group of girls around 20 years old walked near me and I say to the man, oh, that's my cousin Lisa. I immediately ran up to them and said that I'm only 15 and I don't know this man. I told him that you're my cousin. Immediately, they gave me hugs saying they haven't seen me for so long, etc. They told me to come sit with them and to grab my bag and towel. The man immediately walks off. Honestly, I'm so thankful that the girls caught on. The man was just extremely creepy, constantly commenting on my looks while knowing I was young. Edit, I may have overreacted by immediately thinking that I was going to be trafficked, but I do think something shady was up. This happened back when I was 10, and now that I'm older, I realize how scary this actually was for me. One Sunday after church, my mom took me to get some coffee at Starbucks. When we arrived, I asked my mom to let me go alone to order because I wanted to be all grown up and learn to do it myself. With a lot of persuading, my mom lets me go in. She parked right in front and had a full view of me the whole time through the front window. Once in, I wait in the long line. Almost immediately after getting into line, I feel a tap on my shoulder from behind. I turn to see an older man, about mid-40s. He says to me, You look familiar. You look just like my niece. I thought that maybe he was old and just being nice, so I responded and told him, That's cool. I turned back around to continue in line, but then he asked me if I was alone. That's when I get a little spooked. As I'm about to say no, an angel of a lady came over next to me and said, Do you know this man? Are you okay? I told her no, that I didn't. She turned to the man and told him to stop talking to me. She asked if I was with someone and I pointed to my mom outside. She then stayed with me until I got my drink and then walked me out to my mom. My mom knew what happened after the fact and until I got older she never let me go in alone again. Understandably so. It's pretty freaky to think about it now that I'm older and have a better understanding of the world. To this day, I'll never forget that lady who watched out for me.
Growing up, I was terrified of kidnappers, hearing about them all the time, and how they would target little kids mainly for their organs. I'm male and was 10, living in Athens, Greece. It was a normal morning walk to school, and I was about to cross the intersection, then my school would be two minutes of straight walking. As I'm about to cross the intersection, a woman approached me. She was pretty tall and wearing a brown coat. I could tell that she was of Russian, or maybe Ukrainian origin, by her accent. Anyway, our conversation went like this. Where are you going? To school? Your school's not that way. Come, I'll take you to school. Then she proceeded to grab my hand. I immediately started running towards my school, and thank God the light was red for the cars when I crossed the road. As soon as I crossed, she yelled at me to come back, and that my school isn't that way. Then a stop driver saw what was going on and yelled at her to leave the kid alone. I never looked back, I just ran straight to school. Later that evening I told my parents what happened and I never asked about the topic again. We live in a cruel world with people like that walking among us targeting kids. My case was broad daylight and on a busy street too. I hope no kid has to experience something like that. When I was younger, around my freshman or sophomore year of high school, I used to walk to school often, and I liked getting some sort of exercise before school started. One morning in winter, it snowed, but school wasn't called off, so I walked there anyways. While ice isn't the ideal condition for me to walk, I had no way to get another ride. It was about halfway there when a minivan pulled up next to me and the driver rolled down the window. It was some middle-aged lady giving me a friendly smile. Do you need a ride to school? She asked. I shook my head. No thanks, I'm already halfway there and I don't live that far away. I was always taught to never trust strangers, even if it were a condition, I'd rather get a ride in. Are you sure? It sure is slick out. I just came back from dropping off my son, so it wouldn't be a problem. At this point, she was slowly rolling her van forward while I walked. I kept calm, gave her a friendly smile and shook my head. No thank you ma'am, I appreciate the offer, but I'd rather walk. Luckily, she gave up after that, waving and saying goodbye before pulling away. While it's totally possible it was a friendly mom who didn't like to see other kids walking in the snow and ice, it really creeped me out at the time. I wasn't willing to take the chance and even looking back on it now, I feel good about my decision. So when I was 10 or 11 years old, I was with my nephew going to get groceries for his mom. When we were on our way, we saw a lady crying and asking people for help. My nephew was going to the lady to ask her what was going on while I stayed back waiting for him. Apparently, her son got kidnapped and she was asking if we had seen him. So while the lady was explaining things to my nephew, a car drove next to me and asked if I wanted to get into the car. I obviously said no, but when I looked closer at the car, I saw a kid crying in the back seat. All of a sudden, my nephew yells at me, RUN! I was scared and me and my nephew ran as fast as we could. The car kept chasing us until, thank God, we made it home safe. What I think is that the lady told my nephew that her kid was inside that car. Kinda crazy. P.S. We came home without the groceries. So my family is Italian and I've spent a lot of my life in Italy. I feel comfortable there, though I've always known it could be a little unsafe for a woman traveling alone. However, I don't really look or seem like a tourist, so I usually feel pretty confident that I won't be targeted. This naive thinking led me to a scary situation. I was living and working in a smaller city while on a gap year and had made some college age friends who were also from out of the country. We had been spending most of our evenings going to bars, eating good food, all the fun things you can do as a young person in Italy. One night, 
one of my friends and I were hitting a bar when a group of men asked to buy us drinks. There were about four or five of them, all seemed to be Italian and a little older than us. Being new to the city, we felt flattered and excited by the attention from some attractive local men. They bought us drinks and we walked with them to the nearest piazza. Most of the guys seemed normal, maybe a little pervy, but nothing to raise alarms. There was one guy though that didn't talk at all. One of the other guys told me that the quiet guy wanted to kiss me and I should go home with him. I laughed it off and refused. Italian men are known for being misogynist and forward, so it wasn't surprising. They kept flirting with us and asked us to go back and smoke something with them, but we declined. 1 a.m. rolls around and my friend and I decide it's time to go back to our apartments. We say goodbye and start heading home. Unfortunately, we lived in a different part of the city, so after a minute or two, we split ways. My friend lived close by, but I lived 30 minutes away, outside of the city walls. We're both kind of drunk, and we're small women, so we tell each other to stay safe. I began my long walk home. After about 15 minutes, I start to feel weird. I get a strange sensation, and I decide to call my long distance boyfriend just to have someone on the phone. I'm chatting with him, listening to him talk about his day, when I suddenly get a bad feeling. I turn around and standing behind me, about 30 feet away, is the quiet guy from the bar. He's followed me for almost 20 minutes, walking just behind me after I left. I'm on a long cobblestone road in the middle of the night and there's no one else, just me and him and my boyfriend on the phone. I instantly go into panic mode as this guy starts walking up to me. I tell my boyfriend on the phone that I'm being followed and to stay on the line. The guy gets closer to me and I'm almost frozen in fear. I don't want to run because the long road leads further out of the city into a dark strip of abandoned parkland and a stretch of interstate. This man reaches me and has an awful ugly smile on his face. He's taller than I am, probably late 20s, and is clearly on some sort of drugs. He tells me that I need to come with him and grabs me by my arm. My boyfriend is still on the phone, and I narrate everything that's happening. This guy clearly doesn't speak English. He also doesn't speak Italian very well, but is insisting in a thick, strange accent that I come with him. He has me tightly by my arm and pulls me in to give me a disgusting, sweaty kiss. He smells like vomit. I have no idea how I formulated this plan, but I'm proud of what I did next. I told this man that I'm engaged, and that I'm a good American girl, whatever that means, and that I won't go with him, but I'll meet him tomorrow at 12 o'clock and he can take me on a date. He asked me for my Instagram and I gave it to him. Panicked, I watched him type my name into his phone, then he lets go of the grip and turns around. He's happy with the plan we've made. I watch him for a few seconds to make sure he's not going to change his mind and turn back to me. Then I start to run down the road, seriously faster than I ever ran before. I get back to my apartment and lock myself in. I open my Instagram and immediately block this guy's account. My poor boyfriend was so freaked out because there was nothing he could do. So I didn't see this guy again. I was extremely shaken up and ended up moving apartments so I could be within the city walls. When I told my landlord the story to explain why I was moving, she told me about something even more chilling. A year ago, on that exact long road leading out of the city, an American girl was jumped by two men, dragged behind the retaining wall of the interstate, and brutally assaulted. The men were apparently part of a prolific Albanian gang that had a stronghold in the city and were engaged in human trafficking. Remembering the man's strange accent, I am convinced that he was part of that same gang. I don't want to think what could have happened if I had not gotten lucky. I think this man might have just decided I wasn't worth it. That beautiful Italian city I was living in lost its glamour once I experienced that terrifying underbelly. This situation happened about a year ago. 
It's important to note that I'm also a girl, so this was a very scary and potentially dangerous situation for both of us. One night after work, just after it became dark, my girlfriend stopped at the Walmart neighborhood market down the road, which by the way is next to a big highway interstate. I made a last minute run to the bank. Right as I'm pulling out of the bank, I get a text from her about thinking she's being followed. I asked her for more details and also told her not to leave the store and that I was going to drive up to the front door and either watch her get to her car or get her into mine if she needed. She told me that there were two men that she kept seeing in every single aisle, usually behind her. They were very clearly staring at her each time and watched her very closely. She thought she was just being paranoid, but I told her to trust her gut and let a worker know about the situation and even call the police because it isn't worth the risk. Before I made it all the way there, she texted me saying she's at checkout. She said that the guys followed her there and went to self-checkout near her, but with no items. They quickly grabbed some gum off the shelf and put it into a Walmart sack, but they stood there taking forever to cash out that item and kept watching her, waiting for her to finish. I told her to check out as slowly as humanly possible. I finally arrived. She had just texted me that she finally took her bag and was exiting the store. However, right as I pulled up, I saw the two guys. They perfectly matched her description of them. They were hiding in a little cutout near the entrance. They were just standing there and kept peeking around the corner at the front door every time someone exited. I knew they were looking for her. I pulled my car forward right in front of them. I literally rolled my window down and just stared into their souls. I did not look away. I wanted to make sure that even though they didn't know I had anything to do with her, that I got a very good look at their faces and was watching them. I texted her and told her not to return to her car. I told her to get straight into mine. Right then, they started walking off. However, they had to have been following her since she arrived at the store because the next thing they did was walk straight to her car. Her car is very unique and stands out. They dropped the bag of gum on the ground on the way to her car. One of them went behind her car and just stayed there. The next one walked over to a white work van with painted windows and no license plate. He spoke to someone that was in the driver's seat. While this was happening, one of the cars next to hers left. They then pulled the van up to the spot I called her and told her to go straight to my car and don't even look at hers as they were waiting for her with the van. She came out with groceries and they see her and squat down. We really quickly load up and she gets in my car. The men stood up and walked to the van. I pull away and try to go around the van to see the license plate. Of course, there was none. I drove off in a totally different direction from home and we drove around for a while. I wanted to make sure no one was following us and also give them time to leave her car alone. I wanted to call the cops, but she was convinced we were just seeing things that weren't there, like taking a coincidence and making it into something. Obviously looking back, after having talked in depth about both of our experiences, we definitely should have called the cops and I regret this. I've since seen the van with the same two guys driving back in the neighborhoods behind the Walmart. I was turning onto a street and they were turning off, still no license plate, but their van had more things on the exterior to make it look like a work van, things like a ladder on the roof. I got creeped out and quickly tried to get away just in case they turned around and tried to come for me. So I floored at home, again, I thought about calling the police, but what am I going to say? Yeah, there's two men driving away from a neighborhood with a work van. Gotta get them. They don't even take most things seriously, even when it results in something actually happening. I just truly hope there's a valid explanation for all these actions, and that I just want to come to a conclusion that that was not the case, but I don't know. Maybe they waited at the front because they didn't see their buddy with a van, and thought he was maybe inside the Walmart, and were just looking out for him. Her car was very cool, so maybe they just liked it and were looking at it. Maybe they just wanted to steal parts off her car. Maybe there's an explanation, but probably not. 
It doesn't explain them following her, or getting gum in the bag just to drop it in the parking lot. Luckily, I haven't heard about any kidnappings coming out of that Walmart, but who knows, it's not like I've been digging for it. But I do know that I'm extra cautious now, and try not to go out past dark. I also scan the parking lot for the van before I go in, but normally I just do curbside pickup now. My girlfriend does the same thing. I had posted on here a couple times with a few of my creepy encounters. I was having a chat with my mother and my sister about these and they each had their own stories to tell. For now, I will be telling my sister's creepy story. For safety reasons, I will not be revealing names. To give a few details about my sister, she's not the type you would mess around with. She usually had creepy people walk up to her to flirt or catcall her. She would usually tell him to shove off. She can usually handle herself in these kinds of experiences. But she told me what happened at Walmart years ago that really scared her. It happened when she was 23 years old, living out of state with her boyfriend, now husband. It was her day off from work and she was running errands alone while her boyfriend was at work. One of her trips was to go to Walmart and pick up some snacks and a gift for her birthday party. She headed for the toy aisle to pick out something for a gift. That's when she noticed a man in the aisle. He was staring at the toys. My sister noticed right away that he didn't have a cart or anything in his hands to look like he was shopping. My sister picked up an item and moved towards the food aisle to get some snacks and extra stuff. She glanced up after picking up something, seeing the man from before, looking at stuff again, yet he wasn't carrying anything. This made my sister very suspicious. She tried an experiment to see if this man was actually following her. She went to the DVD aisle. He was there. She tried the home decor aisle. He was there. Even the woman's underwear section. He was there. This really scared her. Anywhere she tried to avoid him, he would turn up in the same area. My sister had had it with this man, wanting to get away from him. She made her way to the checkout while she picked up her phone to call her boyfriend. She told him that she had been followed by this man and was afraid to go outside to her car just in case the man would follow her there. Her boyfriend told her to tell one of the employees and stay with them. She did what he told her, telling the cashier about what happened. The employees were super nice and had someone look around the store for this man. My sister then said that while she was waiting in the checkout, she saw the man again. He saw her and ran out of the store quickly. One of the employees then walked my sister to her car safely, and thankfully, she never saw anyone outside or anywhere else after that. Knowing my sister, I'm awfully glad that she decided not to confront the man, otherwise, it could be a totally different story. This happened two years ago, but I was horrified and still have a very clear memory of this encounter. My child was almost two and we were invited to a retirement party from the school board for my mother-in-law. The party was at my brother-in-law and his wife's house. The party consisted of people snacking and drinking and milling around visiting and talking all over the home. I glanced across the room and see my husband holding my son with one arm and looking in another direction, talking to one of his brothers. I see a strange man behind my husband, someone I don't know. He's intently rubbing up and down my son's back, almost in a sexual way. I felt so alarmed by this sight. My husband was completely oblivious to what was happening. I rushed over and grabbed my son and held him while walking in a completely different part of the house. The man followed me. He said, Hey, put your son down. I said no. He kept repeating, Put him down, put him down. He knows who his parents are. It's okay to let him wander around and explore the house. He knows how to find you again. I said no. He started becoming louder, like he had been drinking and lost his inhibitions. He kept insisting I put my son down, and I said, I will never put him down. 
Why are you so interested? Mind you, the kid was awkward and heavy to hold for so long. So I walked across the house with my child and told my husband and one of his brothers that the man was aggressively rubbing my son's back and I think he is a pedophile and wants to molest him. He keeps pestering me and trying to get me to let him wander around out of my sight. I gave him back to my husband with instructions to not ever put him down and to look out for this creepy guy who wants him so badly. I then go into the kitchen where my brother-in-law's wife was, told her about the situation and said if this guy doesn't leave my kid alone I will be making a huge scene but didn't want to ruin the party. She said go for it, no problem if I did. I asked around about who the creepy guy was and he was the school principal. Great, wonder how handsy he has been with the school children. He stayed away after that but I was prepared to go to war for my baby. When I was 10, I was camping at a campground that my family and I went to for years. One day I was riding my bike around the campground. I did this a lot when we stayed the weekend. I rode around the basketball courts and where the game room was. This was a little ways from where my family and I were staying. I had been out for a while and figured it was time to go back. I saw a guy drive up to me in a silver pickup truck and gave a smile. Maybe that's what made him stop, but I was only trying to be polite. He drove up to me and asked what I'm up to and why I'm alone. I told him I was riding my bike and that I was about to head back to my campsite. He tells me to get in the back of his truck and that he'll take me back to the campsite. I felt a little uneasy about it, but me being a kid, I did what he asked because he was an adult. I put my bike on the back of his truck and sat back there with it. He drove around for a while and I got a little uneasy because he was going further and further away from where I was staying. I finally told him my great uncle's name and where we were staying in the camp and he drove in that direction. I didn't even wait for him to stop, I just hopped out when he slowed down. He looked at my great aunt and said, she was lost and asked for help so I brought her back. My aunt looked a little confused but thanked him. I looked at her and said, he told me to get in his truck and I listened. She then talked to me and said not to ever go into someone's truck you didn't know. I get that it was kind of my fault and I could have avoided it. But again, this was the early 2000s and I was raised to always do what adults ask or told you to do. I'm not sure what this man's intentions were or why we drove around for so long. But I'm thankful nothing happened. From when I was born, I lived with my mom and my maternal grandparents. I never met my dad. My granddad passed away when I was around seven and my mom was severely mentally ill and an alcoholic. My childhood sucked and then when I was 11, my mom committed suicide and I got put into care as my grandmother was too old and frail to take care of me full time. It was a shitty time. Only thing I was looking forward to was getting on the train and visiting my grandma on a Saturday. Now I was 11 and there was no way that I would allow my 11 year old to get on a train and take an hour journey each way alone. But times were different back then. So back to the story. One Saturday I had seen my grandmother and was waiting at the same station as I do every week to go home. A man seemed to appear out of nowhere like he was hiding around the corner and sat next to me. He kept looking at me and I was beginning to get a little freaked out. I felt slightly better as I saw there was another person on the opposite side of the tracks waiting for the train. The man suddenly came closer to my face and asked me for my name. I ignored him. I was pretty street smart for my age and knew not to speak to strangers. He then said to me, I asked what your name was, this time raising his voice more. He put his hand on my leg and I looked over to the man on the opposite side trying to get his attention but he looked over and noticed what was going on and looked away. So by now I knew I was on my own. The man was touching me on my leg so I stood up and backed off. He said to me that he has some puppies at his house and he's going to take me to go see them. I said no thank you as he started walking towards me. 
He tried to grab me and I sprinted so fast out of that train station and I didn't stop running till I got back to my grandmother's house. Now I'm an adult and think back to that day and remember the man sitting opposite and looking away, turning a blind eye and wonder was he part of it too or was he just an asshole? I always wonder what would have happened to me if I hadn't managed to run away or if I did follow the man to his house. This happened several years ago, back when I was still in elementary school. So excuse me if I get a few things wrong, I'm almost 40 years old now. My mom had given me the usual curfew of when the streetlights came on, be home. I was at my friend's house, who lived on the same street as me, but about a block up the road. I had to cross one street to get to their house. Their house was on the same side of the street as mine, except having to cross an intersection. It was getting dark. I knew I had roughly about five minutes to make it home. Not a big deal. I've done these walks several times a day, every single day that I was home. On this day, my friend decided to walk me halfway home, which was to this intersection. Sitting there stopped at the stop sign was an aqua green van. That's the color I remember. It was an odd mix between blue and green. Obviously, it's normal for a vehicle to stop at a stop sign. It's even normal for a vehicle to stay stopped for a few moments if they're trying to find their way around the area. What's not normal is for a strange vehicle to wait at the stop sign with no oncoming traffic. What's not normal is for two men to wait for two little girls that they do not know to get close to the van. A van with no back or side windows. Creepy fan to start with. What's not normal is for the passenger to stare us down. What's not normal was to see a gun on the driver's lap. Upon spotting the gun, I whispered to my friend that they had a gun and that we needed to turn around and run. I told her that I was going to go on a count of three. That way she had a chance to stay with me. This was winter in Michigan. There was snow and ice, very slippery. Needless to say, when we started running back to her house, she slipped and banged her knee really bad. This was close enough to her house that her cousin could hear me yelling for her to get up and run, which she couldn't do. I had to pick her up and run with her in my arms. Her cousin was playing in the ice with the ice pick when he came towards us to see what the commotion was about. One of the guys saw my cousin coming towards us. They gunned it out of there as fast as they could so no one could get the license plate. I had to wait at my friend's house until the cops came to escort me home. One would hope that that would be the end of it. Nope. I saw that same damn van following the school bus a few days later. Came home and told my mom. She started following our school bus with a shotgun. She had got it because of the attempted kidnapping. Then I started seeing the guys outside the fence that surrounded my playground at school in a wooded area. For some reason that I'll really never know. They really wanted me. They tried to coax me out of the playground into the woods with them. This lasted for about two weeks before they finally just left. Years ago, right after I graduated from high school, I did a lot of couch surfing and was staying with my friend Mike for a while. His family lived about 30 miles north of the town I worked in and his mother usually brought me down to town with her when she went to work in the morning. Mike and I would often stay late in town and hang out with friends, so we would have to bum rides or hitchhike back if we wanted to sleep in the house. So one Friday, he and I stuck around town too long and missed our ride back. We were young, brave, little tough guys, so we didn't think much about hitchhiking back. We hung around the interstate exit with our thumbs out and scored a ride with these really cool and super high Jamaican Rastafarian dudes in an old Volvo. They ran us most of the way up the highway and dropped us off in a town five miles from where we were headed. Everything was going well. We were happy we made such great time getting that far. We walked through the town, stopped for drinks, and headed out to the north end to start hitching again. We got picked up pretty quickly by a guy in his 40s, friendly, with Kenny G-like hair. He tells us that he's headed right past the road that we were heading for. 
We couldn't believe our luck. I jumped in the front. Mike gets in the back. It's a big old boat of a car. As we come up the turn, dude puts his hand on my leg. I'm like, what the fuck do you think you're doing? I push his hand off and tell him we're getting out of there. It's starting to get dark, but I'll walk in the fucking dark. Guy says, it's cool, it's cool. I'll drive you where you're headed. You don't need to get out of here. And puts his hand back on my leg and keeps driving. I'm like, pull the fuck over now and reach for my pocket knife. Mike, in the back seat, grabs the guy in the headlock, choking the shit out of him. The guy lets go of my leg and starts yanking on Mike's arm, trying to get free. Both hands are off the wheel and the car is swerving all over the road. We're still going at least 40 and I'm terrified we're going to crash. This big tree comes up in front of us, but the driver must have seen it because he slammed on the brakes at the last second. Mike is still trying to pop this guy's head off. I look at the dashboard and realize he's going slow enough for us to bail out. I yell, jump, shove the door open and dive out onto the pavement. The driver realizes I'm getting away and hits the gas. The door springs back and almost catches my feet. The back wheel misses me by an inch and the car is going 50 again. Mike is rolling in the middle of the road and I realize we both had gotten out of the car. I grabbed him and dragged him off the road into the trees. The car is doing a U-turn in the middle of the road about a hundred yards away and is coming back towards us. We eat mud and dirt while we hide as low as we can make ourselves. Both of us are skinned, banged up, and bleeding from the pavement. This psycho drives past real slow, trying to spot us, turns around and comes back again. Every time he gets out of sight, we jump and run through the woods, headed towards Mike's parents' house, still several miles away. Every time we hear the car coming, we drop and hide. The car must have gone up and down those roads dozens of times or more, looking for us. It took us nearly two more hours to make it a couple more miles in the woods in the dark. We finally get to the house, dirty, bloody, and exhausted. Mike's parents go nuts when they see us. Mike's dad is a scary guy. He's huge, about 6'6", and construction worker strong. He's got a beard down to his chest, and his hobby is pounding Budweiser with his friends until they're drunk enough to knock each other out. So naturally, instead of calling the police, he marches down the driveway and makes us stand by the road as bait for this driver to come back while he hides in the woods. We stood there for another two hours, but the guy didn't come back which I have mixed feelings about. Mike's dad probably would have beaten the guy to death if he caught him, which is that guy's problem, but I'm afraid that that guy had a gun or something. After all, he was planning on kidnapping two guys at the same time. Mike's mom made us report it to the police. I never heard if they caught the guy, and that's why I don't hitchhike or pick up hitchhikers anymore. When I was about 13 and my sister was about 12, we were playing outside and jumping on the trampoline. Suddenly, we noticed a strange man standing on our property, watching us. He was on the other side of the yard, near the neighbor's fence. My sister and I ran into the house, and my mom called her neighbor to talk to him. Turns out this guy had a fake gun in his pocket. He claimed to be doing work for another neighbor, but then he left. My mom called the police, and they wanted to talk to him. He lived behind us on the other side of the road. Turns out, he was a registered sex offender and wasn't allowed to own guns. He never came back at least, and my parents put us into self-defense classes. My dad took me to see his favorite team play for my birthday one year. I remember the line was pretty big and we had just arrived at the stadium. Some guy approached my dad and told him that he could get me, 8 years old, in a side door for free and it would just be my dad that needed to wait in line for a ticket for himself. I remember willing my dad to say no inside my head. I could see how off it was 
Yeah, my dad stood to consider it for a while. Eventually, he said no, and that he would just get in the normal way. I literally could have been taken away by this man to God knows where. A few things that stood out in my 8 year old brain was how convincing the guy was trying to be. He kept repeating himself and saying words like free and meet back together once inside. I was super relieved when my dad said no but I was raging at him for even considering it to be an option. The whole vibe was seedy. I had an off feeling for the rest of that day. My intuition told me that this guy was bad news and I also learned that my dad is an idiot. So when I was around two or three years old, my mom and dad, now divorced, were friends with this couple that worked with my dad at his office. They would always ask to babysit me and love seeing me a lot and my parents thought nothing of it. One day they asked to take me to Disney World along with their niece and my mom had no issue with it. My dad on the other hand thought it was weird because they offered to pay for me and everything. He told them no and made up an excuse for me not to go. The couple weren't seen for weeks after that and the company that my dad and them worked for were having an investigation because that same couple who wanted to take me to Disney committed massive fraud and it stole hundreds of thousands of dollars. They disappeared and my dad has no idea what happened to them since he no longer works there but he believes fully that they wanted to take me and disappear. He thinks that they couldn't have kids of their own and really wanted one. It still creeps me out that I could have a completely different life and family. Thank God my dad was home because my mom wanted to let me go. By the way, just for some context, as a baby, I had bright blue eyes and long curly blonde hair. I looked like I could be on toddlers with tiaras, straight up. Not to toot my own horn, but I was an extremely gorgeous baby. Maybe that's why they had their eye on me. But who knows, they could have wanted to sell me too, or worse. Long time lurker here, and first time posting. I'm a 24 year old female. When I was around 7 or 8 years old, I had a best friend that lived right around the block from me. We grew up in a quiet suburban town where you didn't really hear about crime all that much. My friend, let's call her Brandy, lived at a house on the corner with a pretty large front yard. It had a little garden area with rocks closer to the sidewalk at the end of her yard. We would often sit on the rocks and talk about whatever kids that age talked about. I remember it being dusk on a warm summer night. We were distracted by our conversation and neither of us initially noticed the same car drive by multiple times. Mind you, her road was a quiet side street, so it would be a bit odd for the same car to be driving around in circles. The reason we noticed it the final time was because they actually pulled over in the street right in front of us. Initially, I remember thinking that they needed directions, dumb in hindsight, because who would ask kids for directions? It wasn't until we saw both of the car doors swing open that the gravity of the situation began to sink in. Keep in mind, the street was only about 8-10 to 10 feet from where we were sitting on our yard. Both individuals seemed to be men with their hoods up and the passenger immediately lunged at us, saying nothing. My friend screamed and ran towards her front door. I, in total shock, was a bit slower to react. I noticed he also held something reflective in his right hand, most likely a knife looking back. He actually almost grabbed me, but I made a run for it just in time and caught up to my friend at the front door. Now here's the creepiest part. For whatever reason, Brandy's family locked the door. She had an older sister that accidentally locked it without realizing that we were playing outside. I vividly remember banging on the door and screaming with tears streaming down my face, hoping and praying that they would open it up. The men didn't chase us to the door, but they didn't leave yet either. 
I remember looking over my shoulder and seeing them smirking and standing near their car. It felt like they were waiting to see if we were home alone. A moment later, but it felt like an eternity, my friend's mom swung open the door and both men jumped into the car and peeled out. There were actually tire marks on the road from how ferociously they whipped around and sped off. Brandy's mom, who also saw the car peel out, was extremely upset and immediately called the police. I remember my mom also being called, and Brandy and I were both questioned at our house by police officers that arrived soon after that. Brandy and I mentioned we had each briefly noticed a car drive by multiple times, but we didn't put two and two together until after things took a turn for the worst. I've never heard anything else about this after that day, but this experience remains burned into my memory. I still get anxious thinking about what could have happened if that front door didn't open when it did. My parents divorced when I was around eight and my mom moved to another province while I stayed with my dad. I'd fly for visits as an unaccompanied minor up until the age of 12. The unaccompanied minor program essentially buddies you up with a flight attendant and you will stay with them for the entire trip. When I turned 12, I was on my first solo flight that had a layover. I was always told as a kid about people you can trust and uniforms, etc. An indication of a trustworthy adult. When a man, in what I assumed to be pilot overalls, approached me and struck up a conversation, I thought nothing of it. I let him know that I had a layover and was waiting for my next flight. He told me that he was a helicopter pilot and was between flights as well. He said it was nice talking to me and offered to take me to a coffee place for some donuts while I waited. Stupidly, I accepted the offer and began to follow him. We approached the main doors. My oh shit radar went off and I abruptly stopped and told him I wouldn't come. He was very persistent about me coming and pointed to a truck in the parking lot saying it was his, which freaked me out even more. He continued on his way and I think about that interaction a lot and I'm haunted by the what ifs. Maybe it was completely innocent. When I was about six years old, in kindergarten or first grade, I can't remember which, we lived across the street from my school. I mean, right across the street. From our front window, the school property was the majority of what could be seen. I went to the school until my second grade year, when the school was shut down by the district. Most kids were shipped off to whatever school happened to be closest to them and the abandoned property became a community center of sorts for the town of less than 200 people or so. I won't drop the name of this town, but I'll say it's somewhere in Illinois that the estimated 200 person figure was in 1989 and that there are considerably fewer people now as most of the population has either moved away or died and several of the houses have burned down. Today, the town is even more dried up than it was during my kindergarten years. And the last time I visited, it looked as though nature was beginning the process of reclaiming it. I say all of this because it's important that you understand how small this town was. People didn't just randomly show up there. Strangers would be immediately recognized. There was nowhere for them to hide because the town only really had three streets. All but the end of one of them led out of town and the lone end of the lone street that didn't offer an escape route led to a dead end with an ancient old cemetery. Another escape route in a manner of speaking. This town had nothing but a post office, a couple of abandoned buildings that I'm fairly certain used to be general stores back in the distant, distant past and a payphone. Today, the post office is shut down and the payphone is gone. So keep all of this in mind when I say that a stranger or creep would have been noticed immediately.
It's surprising then that I was almost abducted by a stranger in that town from directly in front of the school. Actually, I think I was abducted. That's the weird thing. When I left school that day, the man was standing in front of his vehicle and he greeted me by name. That's what makes this even stranger. The man knew my name. He told me that my mom had sent him to pick me up for some reason or another. Though the memory of what he actually said is a bit hazy, it amounts to, your mom isn't at home. She sent me to pick you up and take you to where she is. Get in and we'll go for a ride. You know, the usual creep thing. And I did. There are certain details I can't remember from this point. Why didn't I just look across the street to see if my mom's car was sitting in the driveway? Maybe I did. Where did I go? I don't know. What happened? I don't know. I have the briefest memories of me sitting in the passenger seat of his vehicle, saying something as we drove out of town. Can't remember what I said. Can't remember what he looked like. Can't remember why my next memory is of us back in my driveway, in the house, across from the school. I don't know if there's something that I've blocked out for the last 33 years. Maybe he took me somewhere and did something to me that creeps through the young trusting little boys and I've just locked it up inside. I hope not. I hope he was some aspiring kidnapper with a conscience who just couldn't accept the enormity of the heinous sin he was about to commit and took me back home. That nothing bad happened to me. That my lack of memory is due more to the entire sequence of events being so uneventful that my little brain felt no need to keep it in storage. I've often wondered in some ways, like through some form of therapeutic hypnosis they show in movies and TV to unlock these memories, or if that's even a real thing. Or if it is, if I want to venture down that rabbit hole and discover what really happened, maybe things should just remain buried. I'm sure you've heard the expression, don't ask questions you don't want answers to. Yeah, I feel that applies here. And maybe someone will tell me it was just a vivid dream that a young child had remembered incorrectly as an actual memory. This is not the case. A few years back, I actually asked my mom about it. Do you remember that strange man who took me from school and brought me back? Oh, yes. Apparently, I told her what happened because she told me about how she went up to the school and raised a bunch of hell over it. And that's all I have to prove to myself that it ever even happened. Up until then, I wondered if I imagined the whole thing. This is, unfortunately, no longer something that I can even attempt to convince myself is true. Who was that man? Why did he take me? Why did he bring me back? What happened that day? I'm a big fan of horror. I love a novel or movie about monsters. I'm an avid fan of Stephen King and creepypastas. But it isn't Pennywise, the Dancing Clown, or Slender Man that keeps me up at night sometimes. No, it's the real monster who almost gobbled me up when I was six years old and then lost his appetite. Thanks for listening. Update. For those of you asking if it was possibly my dad, I just called him and asked him. His response? If it had been me, I wouldn't have taken you back. I would have just kept on driving, and you would have gone to my state with me. That may sound like a joke, but it wasn't. So much for that theory. To give some context, I live in Italy, and usually cities' historical centers have mainly pedestrian zones and a few parking spots for residents. Last week, when my sister and I were walking the dog, we don't put her on a leash at night since she's trained and the streets are empty. Unfortunately, she saw a cat and ran away before my sister got her. My family loves that dog, so of course, we all went searching for her. My parents are divorced and we were staying at my mom's. Bad idea having three women in the streets at night, I know, but we didn't know what else to do. 
I was in my PJs, with my phone running on low batteries, so without a flashlight, and just a few poles illuminating the streets. So it was quite dark. I was shouting my dog's name while we were looking for her, when a 40 to 50 year old man, which I hadn't seen up to that point, said that he saw my dog running a few blocks away from where we were. My dumbass was so worried about the dog that I didn't even ask the guy what my dog looked like. I followed him in silence until we were near a parking spot and he got really close to me and tried to put his hands around my back. At that point, I realized what was going on. I pushed him and sprinted as fast as I could. I know the place really well, so I hid where I knew he couldn't find me and texted my mom. I didn't call her in case he was near and could have heard me. A few minutes later, both my mom and my sister arrived together. We decided to call it a night and went home. That dog was waiting for us at the door. I don't know what this guy's intentions were, but I'm glad I reacted quickly and got away. This story isn't mine, it's my parents' story. My mom and dad got married in Mexico, then set off to cross the border. When they were saying farewell to everyone, my mom's grandma gave my mom a prayer, the Canticle of Mary, to keep her safe and to memorize. My great grandma was a firm believer, and I guess it worked. As you know, people gather in small groups led by a coyote. They got stopped by bandits. I can't elaborate exactly where, cause my mom told me once, and I can't bring myself to ask her again, due to the trauma I know she experienced. Tired, hungry, and thirsty, and even more scared than they already were, they all kneeled down on the ground in a row, arms over their head. These bandits proceeded to ransack everyone's money, valuables, and whatever the heck they wanted. Then they even started pulling up girls and women to take. My mom was praying hard. Sadly, the girl next to her got snatched up. My parents ended up making it safe and sound to the States, became US citizens, started a family, and worked hard. In high school, I would routinely run along the country roads near my family's house. One afternoon, a white pickup pulled over on the side of the road, right next to me, basically stopping my run. A young guy said hi, and asked if I needed a ride. I said no, but he insisted, remarking that it was hot, etc. Luckily, I was standing in a driveway and quickly began to walk up towards the house, telling him, Oh, this is my house anyway. I better get home. He seemed to accept my excuse and drove away. I waited for a while, convinced that he'll come back and check, but he never did. I ran the rest of the way home, faster than I ever had, terrified that he would see me. This happened when I was 14. I attended a private Christian school and had a typical uniform of a white button down blouse shirt and a knee length plaid skirt. I walked to my bus stop, which was about 25 feet away from a major intersection, outside of a gas station. This older creepy white dude stops and tried to get me to come close to his car, for directions. I stayed about 10 feet or so away from the car, and gave him the directions. He kept trying to get me to come closer, and offered me a ride to school. He even blocked traffic when the light turned green, and made people go around him. He just wouldn't leave or stop and my radar was going off like crazy. At that point, I backed up this incline and behind a sign thing so he couldn't get close without giving me time to scream and run. At this point, another guy in the gas station employee who recognized me were walking towards us and the guy took off. About 15 or so minutes later, I saw the guy approaching again so I grabbed the other girl at my stop and told her to run. We both ran into the gas station store, and the employee called the police, which was absolutely useless, and the guy left again. I heard later that night on the news that a girl about my age was kidnapped from her bus stop 
and the car was very similar to the one that the guy was driving. I was totally freaked out and was glad that we ran when we did. After that, one of my grandparents would drive me to the bus stop and stay with me until I got picked up. So today, my friends and I were on a walk, and at some point, I witnessed a scene that was likely a child kidnapping attempt. I am really confused and a bit horrified right now, so I decided to post it here, and hear some opinions about it. Here's the premise. I live in St. Petersburg, Russia. My friend and I often go for walks, and mostly follow the same route through several building blocks, a settlement, with private houses, and eventually a small park. At the edge of those building blocks, just before you enter the settlement located across the highway, we usually visit a store and buy some soda drinks. The place itself is kind of a poor neighborhood with old shabby buildings and infrastructure. I live near that place and some of my friends live right there, so I know it pretty well. Now what happened today, we decided to visit the store and usually we entered together, but this time I had forgot my mask, so I waited for him outside. Soon after, three boys rushed from the store. They were actively talking with each other, and then two of them, first one was about six or seven years old, and the second one was around five, stepped back into the store, but the third one stayed near the store's doors. Those two kids started calling for the third one to go back in with them, very confident. At this point, I didn't really pay too much attention to them. After the third one declined and started saying that he's not allowed to leave the store, it would turn out that his mom was working as a cashier and wanted him to stay in the store during her work shift. Those kids continued asking him to follow them. Then the first kid said the phrase that gave me chills and made me turn around to them and stare, ready to make an action to prevent the third kid from going with them. He said, I know the place where your mom will allow you to go. Aside from the weirdness of the phrase, it also sounded very unnatural and learned. Then both of them started saying this again and again. I was about 7 to 10 meters away and they likely noticed me so they stopped calling him and the first kid asked the third kid how old he was. He replied he was 6. Immediately after the answer, the two kids ran away to the building block. Honestly, I was hoping to stop these kids and ask them about their parents and what they were trying to do and notify the store personnel, but they faded away really fast. Soon enough, my friends came back from the store and I told him what I just saw. He mentioned that he actually noticed those kids inside trying to make friends with the son of the cashier and they were basically talking about normal stuff that kids of their age were interested in. It's unclear when they decided to exit the store and go to the place with a third kid. We both were very concerned about the situation and shortly after I came to the store to warn the personnel about it. I told one of the cashiers everything and mentioned the first kid was holding a sweeps can. She confirmed she saw them, thanked me, and she said she's going to tell this to his mother. I then left the store. Child kidnappings that involve kids of their own age were common in Russia five to eight years ago, and I even remember a case involving a small girl back in Moscow. Luckily it didn't work for whoever was the kidnapper. The situation really shocked me, and I would like to believe that those were just ordinary kids which unintentionally used bizarre words, but it just doesn't seem real anyway. I've been reading on here tonight and I have a few creepy encounters of my own, so I figured, hey, why not? This happened about 12 years ago. I was 14 and my sister was 12. It was during summer vacation and we were hanging out, just the two of us, outside. It was midday and we live in a smallish town where during weekdays it's pretty much empty because all of the adults are at work. Anyway, we had been messing around picking flowers, and other random crap. When we decided to cut through a massive field of undeveloped land on the edge of the suburb, it was technically a shortcut to get home, but it wasn't the best idea because it was a really bumpy, potted land that other kids and teens left all sorts of shit laying in. Well, our bad decision came around to bite us. 
We hadn't made it very far into the field when my sister had got two bad things at once. Some sort of weird twisted metal pierced right through her foam flip flop and into her foot. And right after it happened, she shrieked, jerked, and twisted that ankle on the uneven ground. She started crying and howling, and I was worried. The metal hadn't gone too deep, and I was able to stop the bleeding with the hem from my shirt. But she couldn't walk anymore, obviously. Our parents weren't able and didn't know where we were, and this was before I had a cell phone. My sister was still on the ground crying, and I was trying to calm her down when something made me feel like looking up. It was that feeling of being watched. Out of the field across the road, standing in the corner in the distance, was some random guy watching us. He was too far away from me to see him clearly. All I could tell for sure was that he was blonde, probably adult, and dressed way too warm for July. He was all alone, just staring at us. I've always been a skittish horse, so I looked back at my sister and basically said, get on my back, and that I was going to carry her home, and we were leaving right now. Now, I had to carefully pick my way through this stupid field, in my own crappy flip-flops, with my sister crying on my back. Luckily, she was teeny, but I was no linebacker either. It had just rained a day ago, so the field had puddles of slimy water in the lower spots. We were both kind of wet from her falling when she got hurt. I looked back to check if he was still watching us, and he was. Not only was he still watching us, but he had crossed the road and entered the field. Now he was standing stock still again, just watching us. Ice in the veins doesn't describe it. One of the scariest moments of my life up to that point. My sister looked when I looked, saw my face, and started crying even harder. I just shook her a bit on my back and whispered something like, Stop it. I need to concentrate on getting us home. Watch him and tell me if he starts falling again. Just be quiet. So that's what we did. I started walking down as fast as I could without getting hurt. My sister watched him while I carried her. After less than a minute, she whispered to me that he was falling again. How fast? Just walking. Is he watching us? Yes. I told her to tell me if anything changed and just kept going. I stumped in puddles I couldn't see into when I had to, hoping that there was nothing sharp in them. I lost one of my flip flops in the mud and just kept going. We were about three quarters away through this massive field when my sister whispered what I least wanted to hear. He was speeding up. I turned us right around so we were facing him head on. As loud as I could I yelled something like, hey we see you. Fuck off and leave us alone. I'll call the cops. Nothing. He stopped again when I stopped, but gave no sign whatsoever that he heard me. Just nothing. I turned us around again and kept going. My poor sister was shaking like a leaf and saying my name over and over again. It was awful, and there was nothing I could do but keep going. Eventually, he started following us again at a slow pace. I finally made it into our suburb, out of the muddy field, and onto solid concrete. I told my sister to hold on as tight as she could and booked it. Started running with her on my back as fast as I could. We couldn't see him anymore. Didn't know what he was doing or where he was. And I was going to make it to our house or die trying. Every muscle hurt from carrying her so far. My bare foot was scratched up from the road, but I didn't stop. I kept moving, with my sister looking out behind us. I felt like my heart was going to burst. The fear and suspense was awful. After what felt like forever, I made it to our house, ran across the yard, up the drive, put my sister down, who started crying again. My hands were shaking so badly, I could barely use my key. We made it in safely and I called my mom. She had us lock every door and window and came rushing home. But nothing happened after that. He never found us. We never saw him again. And that's the end. I have no idea who he was or why he was fucking with us like that, but it gives me chills to this day. The way he stopped when I stopped, the way he ignored my yelling, I don't know what he wanted or what he was doing, and I don't want to know. When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We always celebrated this as a family holiday rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to the florist, 
but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital that had a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by my lonesome, cutting across campus to walk through the network of side roads populated with specialty doctor's offices that kept odd hours. The sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly held surgery consultations or performed small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. As I was walking back through said deserted roads with a vase of flowers in tow, I noticed an unkempt 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of the car is hazy, I'm left with the impression that there were at least two men within whose faces I could not see. Initially, I assumed that the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason why they weren't passing by, so I made the point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them that they could safely drive ahead. They still refused to pass by, continuing to creep behind me at a slow pace. I began to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than their destination, and I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed. Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of me spilling the water from my face, I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could. They hit the gas again and matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me and that there was no one in sight to notice. I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot I saw. The car turned in after me. Despite there only being two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot, and there being no other sign of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park at the numerous parking spaces available there. The driver instead opted to pursue me to the partially under construction back portion of the slot behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction, coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small part of rubble against my back and jump from the peak to land painfully on the other side, which fortunately was a plot of undeveloped land by the side of my high school campus. I took a quick peek over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after I reached the top of the rubble and were nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all. They had no business there. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed and didn't stop until I was soaked in sweat in the dead winter and panting in the student lounge among my classmates who didn't seem to give a damn when I told them. Possibly because our hometown is supposedly a human trafficking capital and the crime rate is outrageous. Although I'm convinced that this was something more informal than human trafficking as a dilapidated car suggests poverty. In retrospect, I should have told an adult alerted campus security and called the police non-emergency line. But I was young, insecure, and afraid of getting in trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have a signed permission form to let me do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation and was overreacting. I don't even know what I would told the police if I had called them and I was entirely ignorant of the subject of cars and couldn't have identified the make if I had been asked. I also never saw the face of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited freedoms if they knew I had been in any danger. I feel horrible for never telling anyone and earnestly hope that my secrecy hadn't led to someone being hurt or killed. Whoever followed and tried to trap a 16 year old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day 2016, that's not me. Around Christmas time last year, I was shopping with my mother at a local mall. My mom and I went into Macy's and went our separate ways in the store for a little. In Macy's, they were having a huge sale, so they had a section in the store filled with back-to-back -back racks of markdown clothing. I was sifting through one of the racks when a young man and a woman came over to the other side of the rack, directly facing me. I took note of this. The man mumbled something to the woman, but it was not in English, so I couldn't understand. The man points at me, and the woman shakes her head, no. I can see the mom out of the corner of my eye in a different section of the store, so I stayed where I was and pretended that I didn't notice the two people. I noticed that the young woman looked very nervous and would not even look at the man in the eye. 
She looked at the ground the whole time. The man then FaceTimes someone on his phone. He steps away from the rack and holds his phone up high, showing me to the other person on the phone. I made my way over to the other side of the rack and eventually the two made their way to the escalator and left. This could have been nothing, but the city this occurred in has a big sex trafficking problem. I am a very small girl and was only 17 at the time. I was terrified. I thought I would share this on the subreddit to honestly get some opinions on what you guys think could have been happening. I just got a really bad gut feeling about it and I'm usually the type of person to mind my own business in public. This isn't one of those stories like, oh this man looks sketchy, I almost died. But when I was 16 I genuinely believed a man at Walmart wanted to kidnap me. It started off with him following me. I noticed he was in every aisle my mom and I were in. But at first, I thought it was just a coincidence. He was an older man, probably in his 50s or 60s, and I just had a bad feeling about him. A man in front of us dropped his wallet, and the creepy guy walked up and stuck the wallet back into the man's pocket instead of just handing it to him, which I thought was pretty odd. Shortly after that, my mom and I walked to self-checkout, and I wasn't feeling well, so I asked for her car keys. I walked to the other side of the store where we had parked, but I forgot to where the car was, so I decided to sit on a bench outside the hair salon and wait for my mom to finish. While playing on my phone, I got an uncomfortable feeling that someone was watching me. I glanced up and saw the creepy man staring at me. Now, there's two things you should know. One, the hair salon was closed, so he had no reason to be standing outside. And two, his groceries had already been bagged up so he had already finished shopping. He asked how I was doing and I mumbled out a fine and glanced back down at my phone. I kept looking up at the corner of my eye and every time he was still staring at me. That's when my blood ran cold. I realized that he had been standing behind us when I asked my mom for my car keys. He must have overheard and was most likely planning on following me out to the parking lot. My instincts kicked in and I had a strong feeling that this man was up to no good. I kept trying to call my mom discreetly, but she wouldn't answer. So I got up and walked back over to the other side where she was still ringing up her groceries. I stayed with her and when we walked out of the store, the man was still standing outside of the hair salon. I watched through the window when we walked out the doors and he never took his eyes off me. I'm so glad I never walked out to the parking lot alone because who knows what would have happened. Okay, I didn't realize that this was interesting enough to post, but I've seen worse ones, so here it goes. In 1984, I was 10. Back then, it was just the start of Stranger Danger, and kids really did leave in the morning during the summer and not come back until dinner time. One of those days, I had been playing baseball and swimming throughout the day and was on my way home on my bike. I got to the end of the street and an African American elderly couple stopped me in the middle of the road. The woman was driving and I distinctly remember her thick glasses, but she asked me where the church was and if I could give her directions. I said sure and started telling her. She asked me to come closer because she couldn't hear well. I got close enough to put my hand on the door to help me stay up on my bike and she put her hand on top of mine, but I continued with the directions. Out of the corner of my eye I saw a movement and I turned to see an elderly gentleman with both arms out ready to grab me. He had snuck around the car squatting down the whole time. I jumped back and took off on my bike as fast as I could. The car then took off down the road so I nearly avoided being kidnapped. Funny thing is I went in and told my mom what happened and she just said go wash up dinner will be in a minute. I never really thought about it again until I read the sub. This happened to me when I was about 6 or 7. For context, I was adopted by my grandparents as a baby. One day, my grandparents took me to a public library so I could pick out some books and practice reading. On the way out of the library, I had already opened the book I had chosen and was looking through the illustrations while we walked towards the car. I didn't notice that my grandparents were getting farther and farther ahead of me and I guess they hadn't noticed that I was far behind them. 
Suddenly, I felt a big hand wrap around my arm. A man I had never met before tugged on my arm rather hard. I remember him saying, You're coming with me. I was frightened and managed to pull my arm away. I yelled, Grandma! Papa! and ran towards them. The man didn't try to stop me, he just walked away. I can only assume he didn't realize I was with them due to their age and thought I was an unattended child who had wandered off from the library alone. Maybe he was an off-duty police officer or a library employee who was trying to get me back to the library. Or maybe he wasn't. It gave me a really scary feeling that I remember quite clearly. Yes, it was me. While doing my weekly shopping at a huge supermarket, 30 tills, at the back of the supermarket I noticed a young boy about 4 years old. He was on his own and crying his heart out. I asked him whether he had lost his mother and he nodded. I told him to follow me to the customer service and they could give a shout out on the loudspeaker to inform his mother. As he walked towards the customer service, which was located near the exit door, his mother apparently yelled at me, where are you taking my son? I tried to explain that I found him crying and I was taking him to customer service so that he could be reunited with his mother. She accused me of child abduction and they called the police. I quickly left the supermarket before the police arrived. I won't be assisting any lost kids in the future. This happened around 7 years ago. I took my son with my mother to the shop and as I bagged up my stuff I noticed a man staring at my son. I also had his twin sister with me. I asked my mom to keep an eye on my son while I paid. About 2 minutes into paying or whatnot, I glanced up and saw my son being walked out by this man. I ran up to my son and scooped him up and walked away, which was my biggest regret for not yelling at the man or telling security. I was just in shock that it happened and it happened so fast. That was the most scared I've ever been seeing my little boy being walked out by a stranger. I feel this has changed me as a parent and I'm so overprotective of my kids now. Maybe too much. When I was a little girl, I used to walk home from school every day. It was only about a 10 minute walk and I usually had friends to walk with me. The area I lived in was progressively getting sketchier and sketchier by the year, but at this time it wasn't that bad. One day I had to walk home alone because my friends weren't at school that day. I was about halfway home, singing to myself, when this huge man walked up to me. I tried to walk around him, but he just blocked me and said, Hey kid, do you want to fight? Of course, I said no thanks and kept trying to walk around him when he grabbed me by my wrist and tried to pull me in between two houses. He said, we're gonna fight right now. And I somehow managed to wiggle free from him and run home. I was pretty small and fast back then, so I got away pretty quickly. I got home and found my mom on the ladder fixing something on the roof. I ran up to her and told her what happened. We moved to a new house pretty soon after that. When I was 7 and my brother was 4, we would always go play at the park right next to our house. We lived in a very sketchy neighborhood, but my mom thought it was fine for us to play alone because the park was very close to our house. So one day we were playing at the park, minding our own business. A kid who looked about 5 or 6 came up to us. He seemed a bit uneasy. He asked us what game we were playing and if he could play. We were playing grounders and it isn't very fun when you only have 2 people. So we let him play. After a while he asked us if we wanted to be friends. Being little kids we said yes. So then we played grounder some more. After a few minutes he said, do you guys want to come to my birthday party? My house is really close and today is my birthday. My mom had always told us to ask her before going to someone's house so I told him that we had to ask my mom first. Then he ran off the playground towards a man standing towards the edge of the road. This man had been watching us play for a while, but it hadn't really registered as possible danger. After a minute, the kid came back and said, My dad says you can come to my birthday party. I told him I would have to ask my mom. Then he ran back to the man. When he ran back, he said, 
My dad said that you have to come to my party because we're friends, and it'll be fun, and we can have cake, and he can drive you there. Then the kid took my hand and started leading me towards the man, who started walking towards us. I felt weird, so I grabbed my little brother, and we ran home. Then we watched through the window as the man and the kid got into a big truck and started driving away from the houses. We lived on the outskirts of the small town, so there was nothing for miles and miles the way he was driving. It was insane. I grew up in a safe, beautiful part of my town. All of my neighbors were within five years of my age. There wasn't a moment I didn't have a friend to hang out with. We were even lucky enough to have a park within a couple blocks of our neighborhood. Given the safe nature of our area, we were all allowed to walk and spend time in the park alone. This thread made me remember the time my best friend and I were successful in fleeing an attempted kidnapping. We were around 10 years old and made our way up to the park per usual. This time I got a bad vibe and heard a man screaming, Hello? We were both as teeny as could be and luckily fit under a 12 inch part of the playground where no one could see us. Within seconds of successfully making it under the hiding area, the man yelling appeared. We could see him, but he didn't see us. He said, I heard two girls playing. Where are you guys? Come on out. As he looked around through the tubes, slides, and the rest of the playground set. We lucked out. He didn't find us. We had never been that silent in our lives. After a few minutes of him being gone, we made a run for it. We generally walked along the roads to the playground, but we were aware of shortcuts through other people's yards. This time, we took a dash through the neighbor's yards. As soon as we hit the road again, a car pulled alongside us. It was the man. He asked us to get in his car and that he would take us home since we were so young. We declined endlessly. We kept walking as he slowly followed us with his window down and begged us to get in and let him drive us. We eventually walked up to a random person's house and pretended it was one of ours. We understand now that it wasn't the wisest idea, but we were 10 at the time, and all we knew is that we needed him to get away from us. After pretending this house was ours and going to the front door, he left us alone. We then made a dash to my real house. We never told our parents. We should have. So this happened about 8 years ago when I was 17. We're from the Bronx and everyone knew who we were on my block. I was the one raising my brother so I would take them everywhere I went. But we would spend the summer days at the zoo or different parks in New York City. One particular summer day I had taken them to the park not too far from home and we headed back right before the sunset. As we crossed the street and approached somewhat of an isolated street I noticed a black fan up ahead. Being from New York City, you learn not to react to strange things, but I was still keeping an eye on the van because it was parked right in front of a fire hydrant and didn't have a license plate. I had my then two-year-old brother carried on my right side of my hip, told my seven-year-old brother to get on the right side of me, putting him between myself and the building, and kept walking as fast as I could without raising suspicion. As we were about five feet away from the van, a man steps out from the driver's side and is headed towards the back of the van, but another opens the passenger door but doesn't come out. At this point, the man is approaching us and making an uncomfortable amount of eye contact with me. Something in me decided to point out a window of a house behind him and say loudly, as if I was speaking to my brothers, Look, it's not even curfew yet and Mama's already looking out the window for us. The man stops right in his tracks and looks where I pointed and then looks at us one more time, then ran back into the van. They started it but didn't move, so I grabbed my brother's hand and crossed the street and knocked on the door of my supposed home and prayed that someone would answer. I knocked again and after 15 seconds of sweating bullets, a woman answered the door and I explained to her in a quick whisper that I believed that the men in the van behind us were trying to abduct us and that we needed her to pretend to be our mom. She paused for a second and then smiled and let us in and locked the door behind us. She asked if we were okay and if we needed to call the police. I said that if they weren't gone in the next 10 minutes then yes. When she looked outside about 7 minutes later the fan was gone. 
After that, I had called the son of the shop owner near the building and asked him to meet us and walk us home, and he did. Thank God that woman was home. She told me that she had left work early that day because of a bad migraine. Whatever was at work, I'm grateful for it. This happened about three years ago. It was mid-June around 9.50 p.m. and twilight was fading into the night. It was hot as fuck and I decided to take my then two-year-old son on a short walk around the block to cool off. We were only a half a block away from the house when this 1980s Oldsmobile slowly crept up behind us and slowed down to match our pace. My two-year-old was in the stroller. I stopped and the car stopped. I could see that there were four large men inside, all wearing the same black hoodies. Then two men exited the car at the same time. One of them went to the house in front of me and stopped at the door, another to the house behind me and stood at the house door like they were going to knock. The car with the other two men remained inside to my left, essentially surrounding us. I noticed that neither of the men were knocking on the door, they were just standing in front of it, both staring at me. I was freaked out and decided to walk as confidently as possible past the men in front of me and quickly turn down the corner that was the closest way to get home. I had a feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach, so I decided to walk into the neighbor's darkened yard and hide. As I did, I saw the car with the four men driving down the road very slowly. I waited and about three minutes later they drove past again very slowly. I decided to run after they turned down the street again. I told myself, you have three minutes, so I ran as fast as I could and hid in another neighbor's yard. When once again the car drove past slowly, now with someone in the passenger seat using a flashlight seemingly searching for us. Once it drove past again I ran as fast as I could making it into the garage just in time to see the car drive slowly past with a flashlight again. I put my son inside and watched and they drove past two more times. I don't walk at night if I can avoid it and never with my son. I also carry a 38 revolver and sharp knives. I sincerely believe that they were trying to snatch us, but luckily we got away because I listened to my gut. Please be safe and always trust your intuition. Several years ago when I was 25, I lived with, at the time, one of my best friends. Our relationship eventually started to dwindle, as it usually goes when you move in with a good friend. So she was rarely home. This night, however, she ended up staying at our place, heading to bed early. I was the server at the time, so I stayed up pretty late usually, watching YouTube and smoking pot. This night was no different than any other, except for the fact that my neighbor tried to kidnap me. I'll go ahead and give you some background info on my house and my neighbors. We lived in a three bedroom house with two of the bedrooms and the kitchen facing our crazy neighbors. They were a young couple living in a smaller mill house. They were constantly coming to our door asking for handouts. Now, normally I would be happy to help a neighbor out, but they would come over and ask for crazy shit like for us to fill up an old Mountain Dew bottle with water because theirs got shot off, beer, and once they literally asked me for a dollar. They would constantly be knocking on our door asking for help when we wouldn't answer. I'd peek through the window to see them either jacking a cigarette butt from our ashtray or pressing their eyeballs against the door peephole to see if they could spot us. Anyway, there I was smoking weed and watching YouTube on the couch when I heard a knock on the door. I rolled my eyes because I knew exactly who came a knocking. It's 11 p.m. I checked the peephole, and sure enough, the boyfriend was on my porch. Normally, I would just walk away and continue with my life, but he looked like he was in distress. I opened the door to see what was up. Uh, I just wanted to come over to see if you would film my engagement. I got my girlfriend a ring here in my pocket, and I need you to follow me into my backyard and film it for me. Baffled but curious, I told him congrats and said that I'd be out in a second, just needed to put shoes on. I shut the door behind me and locked it, quickly ran into the back room and looked out into the backyard. I peeked through the blinds to see the setup. 
Nothing. Pitch black darkness. No signs of decorations or anything like that. Naturally, I woke up my roommate and told her what was going on. Uh, yeah, fuck that. She said to me, and we both walked back up to the door after the boyfriend started banging on the door. I couldn't see anything and was confused all the way up until he pulled his eyeball away from the peephole. I quickly turned around and put my back against the door. My roommate came running back to the door from her room, manning two wire hangers for protection. We both clung onto the hangers and sat up against the door until he finally left. We were so freaked out but wanted to make sure we weren't overreacting. We went out our back door and hopped into the car so we could do a drive-by. They always had their front door open and also didn't have any blinds so it was easy to see in the house. Slowly we crept in the car and peered into the living room. Sitting on the couch, all staring at the wall, looking strung out, was a couple and an older man. We sped off and ended up staying at a friend's house that night. I never answered the door for either of them again. One day I came home from work and an older lady was parked in their driveway. She walked up to me as I got out of my car and asked if I knew where the neighbors were. I told her I hadn't seen them in a while and she informed me that she was the owner. She told me that they were months late on the rent and that she finally came to evict them. She entered the home to find it completely trashed, needles and garbage everywhere, holes in the wall, and literal shit on the floor. I told her that I was sorry that she had to deal with all of that, but I was happy that they were finally gone. I'm not 100% sure what was going on that night, but I'm glad I didn't follow him to the backyard. In February 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was really hard for me to deal with, as he had died in March of 2011 and it was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down, mourning and crying, while my body went into full dangerous close mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery and forced myself to get to my truck as quickly as possible without the man getting close to me. By the time I made it to the truck, he had gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck and drove out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he, so I got a really good look at his face. Cut to a few years later. I'm bored at work and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer, and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killer, I came across one that made my heart drop into my ass. Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body, and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would bury kill kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes. After the incident in Alaska, he had traveled into Texas for a wedding in a city not too far from where I lived and had disappeared for a bit and no one in his family knew where he was. He was arrested in that city and brought to the prison one city over from me before he was brought back to Alaska to stand trial. About a year ago, I found a book about him that provided a lot of details I had given here. He had been killing for years and no one knows what the actual death toll was. He eventually killed himself in prison. At the end of the book about him, he described some of his favorite places to abduct people, public parks, and cemeteries. I often wonder if there's a kill kit buried in those woods. You were fast, Israel, but I was faster, and I'm glad we didn't officially meet. When I was about 9 or 10, I went with my dad and my siblings to Goodwill after church service. I can't remember why we went there to be honest, since my dad doesn't really like shopping. Anyway, we went straight to the appliance section and were just standing there for a while while my dad was looking at a couple mason jars. I remember my brother and sister messing around a little bit away to the left of him. I looked around behind me and saw a broken toy violin across the store in the electronic section. 
I was extremely intrigued by it for some reason, despite not having a significant interest in music at the time. I for some reason didn't ask my dad and just sped across the store to check it out. After walking past a couple rows, I approached the violin and started pushing the colored buttons, indicating the different strings. For like 5 minutes I just stood there pressing the buttons even though no sound came out. I suddenly felt someone standing so close to me that I could feel the heat coming from behind me. Before I turned, I heard a man say, Hey, that's a pretty cool violin. I wasn't as panicked as I should have been and literally just turned my head to the side and saw this greasy guy with a beer belly and an extremely long blonde ponytail touching his waist, wearing a baseball cap, stained wife beater, and cargo shorts. I just kind of stared at him like, Oh, haha, <laughs> yeah. He picked it up and was like, dang, how much do you think you can get for this? It looks pretty expensive. As I just stood there, uh, I don't know, it's plastic. He then said, that was nice playing, you could become a pro one day. Then he was just staring at me like, for way too long. I started to get a weird feeling, but thankfully my sister came up behind me and yanked me back and legit said, get away from him, he's a pedo and dragged me back to where my dad and brother were. The guy quickly put his violin down and started walking across to the entrance. I remember my sister continued scolding me and for some reason I kept saying, Stop, I'm talking to him. What the heck? I'm pretty sure I know what stranger danger is. What was kind of strange though is that my dad was still looking at the same jars in the same spot the entire time. I think at least 15 minutes had passed. My sister told him that I was talking to a stranger but I just remember him saying, okay, time to go, and that was that. I can't remember the rest of the day. Strangely enough, I started learning violin for strings class later that fifth grade year, but just picked it up again senior year. I recall this event randomly while practicing. Okay, so I was 23 at the time, and this happened last March during Easter Sunday. I live in Canada, and I am a native woman. Little backstory, I was in an accident and was rushed to the hospital two hours away from where I lived. I spent the day in the hospital and finally was discharged that evening. I couldn't find a ride home or family willing to pick me up. Plus I had no phone, nothing only in my wallet. Everything else was lost during the rollover. It was about 2 a.m. when I called a taxi. Yes, I know, stupid. My family always told me and warned me about co-op taxis. Those men are creepy, but I literally had no choice. I got picked up and the taxi man right away asked, Wanna come camp at my place? I can bring you home tomorrow. I told him I had to be home tonight. He then offered to buy me coffee right before we left the city. I noticed when he was ordering through the drive-thru, he took a while to give me my drink. Me being paranoid, I thought he might have slipped something in there. I held it during the whole ride, but didn't drink it. He was taking me through all these weird back roads I had never been before. I know the way back from the city, but he insisted that we were going the right way. As we were getting closer, he kept asking me weird questions. He asked, Can a man like me come date women out here? Will your men do anything? Am I allowed to be here? He was Muslim, but the one that scared me the most was when he asked, Do you want to come back to the city with me and be my wife? Let's go to your house and pack up all your clothes and you can come back with me. He also asked at the point, What if I never bring you back? What do you think would happen? Let me tell you, I've never prayed so hard to make it home alive in my entire life. I thought I was going to be another missing and murdered indigenous woman. Nobody knew I was coming home, nobody bothered to try to pick me up, and my house was empty when I got home. Sometimes I think, what would it even matter if I came home or not? I know I'm fortunate to have lived through the accident and being brought home, but it just hurts that no one was there to see if I was okay mentally or emotionally. I've told some people this story and they just told me it's my fault, do it again. I just figured I'd write this here, needed to get it out. So when I was a kid, my family was really close to the across the street neighbors. 
I was playing outside with the daughter when my parents told us that they were going to run to the store for a bit. We asked them if we could stay at my house as her parents were home right across the street. I had a cool Barbie dream house. My parents said yes and made sure to tell her parents to keep an eye out. Once we were inside we were thrilled to have the house to ourselves just like big kids. We made ourselves some lunch and watched cartoons for a bit. There was a sudden knock at the door and the fun begins. Because of the urgency of the knock, I hopped up and ran to the door thinking it was my parents who forgot something. After looking through the side window, I saw what looked to be my friend's brother. I flung the door open and there's a man who was not my friend's dorky six foot tall brother. The man looked jumpy and told me that he needed to come inside because he had just hit my parents car. I immediately panicked and asked him which one. He took a few steps back to look at the driveway and said, the red one, my mom's prized BMW. Now don't judge me too harshly, I was maybe 9 or 10 and someone told me that they ruined the car that my mom loved just as much if not more than us kids. I blurted out that my parents weren't home and he told me that he still needed me to come out to see the damages because obviously a 9 year old can access the damages to a 1990s convertible BMW. I looked back at my friend and while we chatted he reached out to open the screen door. It was locked but it was one of those shitty plastic ones that could easily have been yanked off with a little hard pull. It wasn't until then that my alarm bells went off. I told him I had to call my mom. He started to protest but I slammed the door shut and immediately called my friend's mom. Thankfully she's a pretty intimidating lady and she marched over before we could even finish explaining what just happened. The man was obviously startled by someone getting there so quickly. When she demanded to know why he was at the door, he stammered something about selling magazines. Obviously, he didn't have anything with him, so she told him to get lost and she was calling the cops. It was at this point I looked out and noticed the car pull up and he quickly went to hop in. I think that's when we all came to the realization at the same time that someone had been in the car waiting for him at the top of the street. My friend's mom turned white as a ghost with recognition, then immediately red with anger. Let's just say we weren't allowed to be home alone for a long time after that. I was 14 at the time and stopped over that night at a friend's house. It was around 8pm and we decided to go out to buy some cookie mix. But since I left all my clothes at home, I had to borrow my friend's fairly short summer dress. Since it was quite bitter outside, I wrapped my face around with my scarf, put as many socks on as I could find, and headed out. We only had a few bucks to spend, so we were in the shops rummaging for quite a while. That was when a nice older man asked if we wanted the rest of his change, and being the children we were, we obviously said yes and gladly took his money. But we couldn't find the mix we were looking for, so we decided to go to a shop that was more up the hill. We crossed the road and started making our way up the hill when this small blue car pulled up. It was the old man. He reached his hand out the window and said he found some more cash in his car. I remember thinking, wow, what a generous old man. So I took the money, thanked him, and continued walking up the hill. When we were around a quarter way up the hill, I saw the same blue car turn the bend and pull up in front of us. It was the same old man. He reaches his hand out and says, oops, I forgot about these, and handed us a bunch of loose change. I started to panic a little, but regardless, I took the money, to be polite, and he drove off around the bend. I told my friends that I was starting to get a tad suspicious of the bloke, but since they were around a year younger than me, and both had autism, I don't think they really understand the severity of the situation. We carried on, walking although this time, I made sure that we walked a little bit faster. Not even a minute later, the blue car pulled around the bend and parked in front of us once again. This time he said, oh I found you a fiver. He yet again reached his arm out and waited for me to take it. I started to go into panic mode. I generally felt as if I or one of my friends was about to get very hurt. I had to think fast so I pulled down my scarf so I could talk to him better and said, thank you very much sir, and very quickly took his money and pulled the scarf back up. He mumbled to himself, so that's what you look like. 
which quickly was followed by, oh no, it's fine, really. In a somewhat of a skittish, or I guess embarrassing manner, he rolled up his window and quickly drove off. I never saw him again after that. I know, probably not one of the creepiest, but it was scary for a 14 year old me. This was quite a while ago. I was about 8 or 9 years old and my dream was to be an archaeologist. A friend of my mom's knew someone that was actual real life archaeologist. Imagine my excitement. I was expecting one of those Indiana Jones types. Instead, she was a 20 year old postgraduate student that worked at my city's natural history museum. I met her at a gathering that my mom's friend threw and started talking to her about my interest in the field. I think she found my fascination with her area charming as she invited me over to the research section of the museum so I could look at things that weren't open for the public. It was a very cool experience which I greatly enjoyed. The creepy part came after my visit was over. As a way to thank my new archaeologist friend for the tour, my mom offered her a ride to her house, which she accepted. At this point, it was maybe 8 p.m. I don't really remember, but at this point, it was already dark out. When we arrived at her house, we noticed that there was a person waiting in a car with all the lights off in front of her driveway. The archaeologist was kind of creeped out by this, especially since her roommate wasn't in town. So my mom told her not to worry and that we would wait until she entered her house before we left. She exited the car and went into her home without any incident. However, as soon as she closed her door, the parked car, still without lights on, drove off in a hurry with tires screeching and everything. Even though it might seem kind of uneventful, it still really creeps me out to think what would have happened if I hadn't been invited to the museum, if my mom hadn't offered her a ride home that day. This happened when I was around 4. My mom and I were walking on a large sidewalk when I arrived at a crossroad where we had to wait to cross the street. At the street corner right behind me, the spot where we were waiting, there is this very big grey building. Since there were no glass walls, you wouldn't be able to see what was around the corner until you reached the end of the sidewalk to where my mom and I were. So out of nowhere, my mom turns around real quick and pulls my arm strongly. All I can remember is looking behind me to find a woman stretching out both of her arms in my direction with her hands positioned to grab me. My mom took me off the ground by her arm, slammed me against her chest and hugged me and started yelling at the woman, something along the lines of, What the fuck are you insane? The woman likely saw us from a distance and decided to hide behind the building right on the edge. So once we passed by her, she could grab me. To this day, I wonder what the hell the woman would have done if she had managed to snatch me from my mom. This isn't that interesting, but I'm pretty sure I almost got kidnapped a few months ago. Every night, I walk my dog, a lab mix, around 4 to 7 p.m. because it's winter and it's been getting darker earlier lately. I usually have music blasting in my earbuds and keep my head down because of how cold and windy it is. But one day, I was walking my dog closer to 8-ish. I noticed a truck slowing to a stop next to me. At first, I didn't think anything of it because it was a stop sign, but the man driving parked and got out of his truck. I took out my earbuds as I walked by with my dog, who since he's young is pretty excited around strangers. He started barking and straining against his prong collar and the man who started walking around the bed of his truck got back in and drove off. I'm pretty sure if my wild sweetheart dog wasn't there, the man would have tried to do something. Needless to say, I went home pretty quick after that. I'm a 32 year old male. I had to walk a mile from the bus station to get to my house as a kid. The road I lived on was a small gravel road, so the bus didn't go down it as part of its route. It was in a very rural part of Pennsylvania in the 90s. I hated that walk, especially when a storm was rolling in or something. I was walking down the road, which had no other houses on the whole road besides our house. Suddenly, a car stops next to me and asks me if I want to ride. I don't remember saying yes, necessarily, but they managed to convince me to get in. 
It was a teeny car, and two men sat in the front, and three in the back. They told me that there was plenty of space, but I had to sit on one of the dudes laps. I remember like it was yesterday, that when they dropped me off, I can remember them all waving to me super happy, shouting out the car, thanks, thank you. I casually mentioned it later to my parents that night, and my father got furious and interrogated me on what happened, and who they were, what they looked like, exactly what did they say, etc. I remember them asking me if I was my father's son, they knew his name, and that's how they made me feel like it was okay to get in the car. He repeatedly yelled at me that I'm never to go into anybody's car. I remember him being fixated and asking me about how and what they said when they thanked me. I remember him making some phone calls and rushing out for the majority of the night. What sticks out with me is I remember the ride seeming way longer than it should have been. I remember having this feeling of dread like I might never actually be back at my house again. I remember a sense of disbelief and relief when they actually dropped me off in front of my house. I grew up in a big house that was in the corner of a quiet street right in front of a five star retirement home. On the other side of the street, in between the big beautiful houses, was a small, old house with wood covering all the windows. If you didn't live on my street, you'd probably think that no one lived in that sketchy house. Throughout the day, random cars would pull up into the back of the house where they couldn't be seen and I would see men walk out of the house. Sometimes the men would sit on the front porch and drink and smoke. Around 9.30 each night, the nurse and caregiver shifts would change at the retirement home. In front of my house, there was a bus stop where all the employees would wait for the bus or for their rides. It was approximately 10 p.m. on a warm night in June. I was in the basement and had the windows cracked open. I was at home with my mom and three sisters when I heard screaming from outside. My sisters heard it as well. We looked outside of the windows, but it was too dark to see anything clearly. We saw a woman running around the three cars in our driveway and assumed that someone was breaking into one of our cars, but she was being chased by two men. We got scared and ran inside to our mom. My sisters and I were young teens at the time and too scared to go outside. The screaming continued for a few minutes and I saw the man grab the woman and try pushing her into the trunk of their SUV. She was trying hard to fight and resist. At that exact moment, my dad was arriving home and noticed a black jeep with the trunk open blocking the street. Flashed his lights and honked at them, not thinking anything was going on. The kidnappers must have thought someone had spotted what they were doing and immediately threw the woman on the ground, got into the jeep and drove off. My dad parked his car and found the woman on the ground. She was crying so much and she kept thanking my dad. As my dad connected the dots, he realized he stopped her from getting thrown into the vehicle. He looked around and saw a few men standing outside the sketchy house and realized that they were watching the whole kidnapping happen without interfering. He invited the woman into our home and she called the police. She was a 55 year old nurse and she told us that she waits outside of her house for her son to pick her up every night. When the police arrived they took statements and gathered the kidnapper's fingers. When I was around 10, a girl named Karen who was the same age as me asked if I could go with her and her family to Walmart which was not too far away. I said she would have to ask my dad, which her mom came out and told me to call my dad over so she could ask him. My dad informed me I would be gone for an hour and then would return back home. This isn't what happened. I left with these people and while I was away, I realized nothing that I went through was normal. I was taken to a farm where other kids my age were there. As I was instructed to bathe in a bucket along with my friend Karen, her mother left us there for a while as we wandered around to meet more of the children. They took us to an ice cream shop where I asked when I was going to go home. Karen's mother looked at me and told me, never. Around three days later, her mother returned me to my grandmother's house after my family finally threatened to call the cops. I don't understand who and where those children came from on the farm. I never understood why my family took so long to get me back. I don't understand none of it. I still don't.
I'm a 24 year old female. This happened to me when I was about 10 or 12, so it's sort of hazy. I truly didn't see anything wrong with what happened at the time, but my mom was very upset and worried when I told her about it. I was with two friends who were sisters, one about 10 and another one around 8. Their house was near the elementary school that we had all attended, so we decided to ride our bikes down there and play on the playground since it was the weekend and the school was empty. We're nearing the school when a minivan drives up with the middle-aged man in the front seat, seemingly alone in the car. The man stops, rolls down his window, and asks us which direction the highway was. We all shrugged and looked at each other weird. My youngest friend and I are closest to the car, while the other friend is a bit ahead of us. I'd been warned about talking to strangers, so I kind of moved my friend and I away from the sidewalk while she gives him vague directions, because what 8 year old is going to know about where the highway is? I don't remember what happened, but I think he just ended up driving away. Thinking back in this as an adult gives me chills. Why on earth would a grown man pull over to an elementary school to ask three young girls where the highway is? My mom was understandably upset to hear this, but I didn't understand why until I got older. I think he may have been trying to abduct one of us. I was 11, almost turning 12, and my family decided to go to America for a holiday where we stayed in Las Vegas for a few days at the Stratosphere Hotel. The hotel is split between hotel rooms and a large casino that we sometimes had to walk through to get to the hotel. One night, my parents had to go do something, so they told me just to wait there. Stupid of them. It had been quite a while and they still hadn't returned. Later, a woman, probably in her late 20s, approached me and asked me if I could accompany her to the elevator because she had a fear of them. As a naive 11 year old, agree, as I love being a helping hand to other people. However, I wanted to tell my parents where I had gone to so they didn't have to worry about where I went when they came back. I told this lady this and went on a quest to find my parents in the Vegas casino alone, not really sure where they had gone but wanted to find them fast because I didn't want to keep the lady waiting. I couldn't find my parents so I decided to go back and accompany the lady anyway since I had nothing better to do and probably be back before my parents got back. To my dismay when I returned she had gone. Soon after my parents had finally came back and they explained that she was most likely going to kidnap me but left because I said I was going to tell my parents. In retrospect. I find it completely stupid to leave an 11 year old alone in a casino for 20 plus minutes. It was a recipe for disaster and God knows what could have happened if this lady had still been there. Not sure if this is creepy to others, but it certainly is to me. This happened to me when I was roughly 17. My hometown is a fairly small country town in Australia. It was really hot that day. I remember the weather being within the 40 degree celsius heat wave. I had decided to walk to the town center for a classic frozen coke from McDonald's. Being a small town you tend to know everybody and every car that drives along throughout the residential streets. I was only a few blocks away from my house when an old rusted station wagon had pulled up beside me. There was a man sitting in the driver's seat and he looked to be in his mid to late 30s. He rolled down his window. I was still walking past trying not to pay attention and he was staring straight towards me. Hey, sorry to bother you. Can you please give me directions to this road? At that point, I gave the man directions and was a relief thinking nothing bad would happen. I had started walking away when I heard him yell out from the car again, this time telling me I'm pretty and asking to hang out. I told him to fuck off and kept walking but paid attention to the car. I had walked a few more houses down when he reversed his car to my side. You should get in the car, he said with a stern tone that makes me cringe to this day. At this point, I turned around and started walking back towards my house as it was way closer and seemed like a safer option given my family was home. I shouted out to him to go away and leave me alone, but this only made him angrier. His voice got angrier and louder and he shouted at me to get in his car. 
He then hopped out of his car and started walking towards me laughing. I never knew I could run so fast home. The guy followed me home all the way up to my driveway. The moment I got to my driveway, the man turned around and walked away. My dad was driving around trying to find the guy and after what seemed like an hour passing, he came home and he said there was no sign of him. I had made a report to the police and after a few weeks, the police notified me that they had found him along with various articles of women's clothing in his car and what he had been doing. I often wonder what would have happened if I didn't run when I did. I'm thankful it didn't get any worse. Definitely a creepy encounter that I have experienced. During the beginning of freshman year, one of my teachers was having health problems, so we had a sub most days. This happened a few months after she came back. I was sitting on a bench when one of the subs we had came up to me. There was a gym across the street and he looked like he had just came from it. He was wearing workout clothes and holding a large duffel bag. He knew my name and started talking to me about school. Me being young and naive, I thought he was being friendly and didn't realize anything was off. After a while, he sat down on the bench and got really close to me. We had been talking about a book that I was reading for school when he started telling me that he had a signed copy of it in his car and that he would really like to show me it. I know I'm stupid, but at this point, I didn't really think anything was off. He kept on mentioning in his car and that he needed to drop off his bag, but he really liked to continue the conversation and asked if I could walk with him. About 20 minutes into our conversation, I know, should have been a red flag, but teacher talks to a student in public for that long. Well anyway, my dad finally came out and freaked out when he saw some random middle aged man talking to his teenage daughter. When the sub saw my dad, he introduced himself as my teacher, but then left rather hurriedly. Somehow at this point I still didn't feel off until a week later when I was reading the book we had talked about and something clicked. I started freaking out. He was huge, well over six foot, and could have easily overpowered me to get into his car. We were mostly by ourselves in the car park. Also, he could have had anything in that duffel bag. I think the final thing that confirmed his intentions was when a few weeks later I stayed after school to talk to a teacher and was taking a shortcut through one of the campus buildings. I was the only one in the hallway and looked into the classroom and saw him. We made eye contact and he yelled my name. I started running down the hallway as fast as I could and he started screaming at me to wait and that he needed to talk to me. I didn't stop running until I was a few blocks away from the school. After that he kind of disappeared. I never saw him again. I really wanted to report him but I actually had no idea what his name was. None of my friends did. I feel especially bad about that because what if he's done it to others since then? I guess the silver lining of online school is, as a sub, he's probably out of a job and the lockdown would make it a lot harder for him to do this to others. When I was eight, my cousin, brother, and I walked to the store for my mom. The store was about a block away. They had got what she needed and I stayed to get a coke. When I left, there's this red Ford Ranger that followed me and I didn't think much of it because it was a short walk. Then I realized that no one lived on the same street as my mom. So I turned around and I walk in a circle and he kept following me. So I run home. The next day, we were watching the news and I saw the man and the truck. He was detained for attempting to kidnap kids. A few days ago, I was walking to the Dollar Tree not far from my house and I've done it hundreds of times and I've only had mild creepy encounters with men insisting on giving me a ride. Before now, the worst was this old as hell grungy looking man who stopped and didn't even ask if I needed a ride. Just pulled over and said, you're looking real good. You should take a ride with me in my truck sometime. And in a split second, I felt intense disgust and dread. So without even answering, I just bolted he didn't follow me, thank God. But I took that walk to the Dollar Tree and thought nothing of it. And the next day, they never caught me outside and told me that she saw a man on the highway following me slowly in his car. And he only stopped and left in a hurry once he realized the neighbor was intensely watching. 
I was only vaguely aware of the car near me because I was preoccupied with getting across the road and I never realized that I might have been in danger. Now I'm terrified. This could have been someone that had been watching me long term and I never suspected it and they might still be waiting for another opening.